I have six o'clock, Andrew. Okay, and we did have the vice mayor come in. Um, so I think we we can we can go ahead and move forward. Okay, you're going to pull the agenda off so we can cite everybody. I can do that. Thank you, sir. Okay, it is six o'clock. I want to call this meeting to order. We are to order. Uh, can we uh, stand in pledge, of order, please? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, for which it stands, which it stands one nation, one nation, the God, indivisible, justice, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the invocation, and I have asked Commissioner Wiki, there he is, if he would provide that with us, please, sir, the invocation. Sure. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, we invite your presence to our meeting this evening. With a heavy heart, we pray that you will help us be leaders that unify people in a time when there's great division. We pray that you would help us be leaders that stand up for justice when we see injustice. We pray that you would help us be leaders in kindness and compassion for our fellow man. Help us be leaders that are an example and how to respect one another despite our differences in opinion. Lord, we ask that you would grant us wisdom tonight as we make decisions that affect our city. Be with our city staff as they work diligently for us all. We once again pray safety for our first responders and ask that you'd bring peace to their family members. Help them know that you're with their loved ones as they continue to selflessly serve our community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the roll call. And there's Ken. Ken, roll call, please. Commissioner Mullins. Present. Commissioner Burr. Here. Commissioner Klinger. Here. Commissioner Wiki. Here. Commissioner Malone. Here. Commissioner Lippman. Here. Vice Mayor Good. Here. Mayor Heil. Here. Uh, before we get started, the next thing, Skip, would you tilt your screen a little bit so we can see your face? Perfect. Thank you, sir. Uh, next item on our agenda is the proclamations and presentations. Uh, if you are aware of, we had an issue in our last meeting. Something was said that was not very uh, appropriate at the time. Uh, we have asked uh, Commissioner Klinger uh, explain a little bit this, what happened here and that he's got some comments on that. Uh, Commissioner Klinger. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, three weeks ago at our last commission meeting, uh, towards the end of our uh, session for the public, uh, during staff and commissioner comments during discussion of uh, opening on Tuesdays, uh, uh, some an unfortunate and inadvertent situation occurred. Uh, I myself uh, choosing to multitask during our uh, commission meeting, uh, which is unprofessional uh, and a standard of giving dedication to the time. Um, I. Uh, uh, I made a choice to uh, multitask and do other uh, uh, constructive uh, tasks during uh, during the evening. I, um, uh, as I finished my commentary and uh, moved away from my screen, uh, my mic was left unmuted. Uh, it was heard a short time later uh, that um, there was some unfortunate uh, vulgarity that was caught from my microphone uh, while uh, maneuvering some larger machinery and equipment uh, and my, uh, my homestead, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I was caught speaking out of turn. Uh, I apologize greatly for that. Um, it, was, uh, it was an unfortunate situation, uh, accidental, no less uh, unprofessional and uh, uncalled for. Uh, Skip, I apologize. Uh, after seeing the video and looking further into it, I noticed that it came uh, shortly after comments made by you. Uh, these, uh, this language was not directed toward our 
commentary, nor was it directed towards the commission. Uh, I, uh, I reluctantly um, have to stand here today and apologize for this uh, because this is simply no, uh, there's no place for this in our commission meetings and there really is no place for multitasking. Uh, my dedication to my town is important uh, and what I do here is very much uh, something I care about a lot. Uh, as I continue on here in the remainder of my term, uh, I will do my best to maintain a high level professionalism from here out and uh, hope that anyone that uh, did hear that um, uh, any further uh, can understand uh, and accept this apology. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I was going to ask if there's any uh, of the commission comment, if any commissioners want to comment. I don't see any hands or anything like that. So let's move on to the next. There's also one other uh, proclamation presentation, uh, hydroelectric plant operations report, John. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, over the last couple of years over at the hydro plant, we've had a series of events come up that minor repairs, major repairs that have prevented us from generating the uh, kilowatt hours that we normally would expect. And staff has been trying to get that fixed. They'll chase one thing and another. It's a, a relay, a pressure valve, gate seals, head gate seals. So um, in an effort to try to find someone to give us some assistance and outline process uh, contact a group called the Midwest Hydro Users Group and talked with a representative from Ayers Associates, who's a consulting engineering firm. And they recommended that we contact Mr. Scott Clabunde uh, from Hydro uh, HCMS Hydro Consultants and Management Services. So they, they spent some time, uh, Scott came to the plant on June 15th, spent some time with Keith Skaggs and David Johannes reviewing a, what's physically there getting some history and taking a look at the equipment. And then based on that uh, day, day and a half survey and subsequent conversations put together a report that's in your packet. So with that, uh, Scott is also uh, at the meeting and I would uh, surrender the time to Scott to go through the report, his findings uh, and see if there are any questions after that. No recommended action at this point, um, but we will be coming back after discussing the report with uh, city manager, city controller and internally and see what, what the next steps are. So with that, Scott, I will turn that over to you so you can go through your report and then we can respond to questions afterward. Okay, good. Thank you, John, for that introduction. So as John said, we uh, I, wor I work for a company called Hydro Consulting and Maintenance Services. And John had asked us to, on recommendation, had asked us to come in and take a look at your hydro plant and determine uh, what could be done to increase the value um, and also maximize the value and also identify any risks that, uh, that were associated with the plant. So uh, we did that, we came in, we did an inspection, we spent uh, two days at the plant and uh, the report that's in front of you is a summary of our findings. And uh, I'll give you just a brief, uh, overview of our findings, and then uh, perhaps some questions, and we can dive into some of the details and, and answer some more questions that you, you may have. Uh, as you know, you have two, two powerhouses there, uh, powerhouse A, powerhouse B. The newer powerhouse uh, was the one that uh, really, where, where you have some risk. And uh, for sake of time, I won't go through what we found in, in the uh, older powerhouse, powerhouse A. Uh, there were some minor things there. We found the equipment generally in, in good condition, uh, well-maintained, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and we found a, a plant that had a, a good level of reliability and should continue to be that way, perhaps with, with some minor exceptions, but we found that to be well-serviced and in good condition. Uh, the newer plant, uh, we found just the opposite. Uh, we found a plant that um, the units had been offline, uh, continually offline for uh, long periods of time in the last uh, few years. So we wanted to understand, and John wanted to understand, you know, what 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 could we do to to uh, to get these units back to uh, generating at reliable 
um, at a, a expectation of, of uh, a good reliability. And uh, what, what we found, um, and again, we spent some time with the operator, just really try to understand uh, what the situation was. And as the report indicates, um, you've got uh, units that have uh, really, uh, you're trying to run units that have exceeded their, their life cycle or their uh, a time when they, when, they, when they should be gone through and completely rebuilt top to bottom. And uh, typically on, on units like this, uh, it's about 30 years. And uh, the company I work for specializes in, in, in this type of a unit, repair of this type of a unit, adjustable bladed unit. And once you, once you start to get beyond that, that uh, 25, 30 year period, which occurred about, you know, about eight, eight or 10 years ago, you're going to start to experience some component failures. And that's just really exactly what's been happening with your plant. And the, uh, the operating staff has done, a, I think, a, a very good job in trying to keep up with it. But uh, the facts are, it's just, it's overwhelming to them. These, these are complex units. Uh, the controls are complex. Uh, the the, the, uh, the drivetrains with the high-speed gearboxes, uh, they're, they're complex. And uh, so what's been happening is they've been trying to repair as you go uh, kind of approach. And, um, you know, they, they, they no longer get something repaired and, and another component fails. And, you know, you have a, you run a pretty tight ship. Um, the guys just don't have, uh, a, a, you know, time to babysit these, these two units like this. And consequently, um, you have these outages, which, which, what we did is we summarized the, uh, the, the, the biggest risk really is, is revenue, a revenue risk here. I, I guess there's other risks associated with it, but uh, what we did is we took a look at what the potential for the plant could have been or should be. Uh, and that was relatively straightforward exercise. We took a look at the water that's available in the river at the plant and we took a look at what the capacities are in terms of uh, water use. And then we applied an industry standard of 85% uh, capture of the potential. And then we took a look back, year, years back, John was helpful in giving us the, the data so we could make some comparisons of what the energy did look like when the plant was, was running better, that plant, plant B and uh, kind of quantified what we found. We found that you're missing about 50% of your, of your revenue, um, of your generation because of the, the issues that are plaguing you with these two units. So I guess the obvious recommendation is, is to, uh, as is in the report here, is to get these two units uh, overhauled, gone through, so that you can have uh, another, you know, another run of, of 30 years of reliability and get the production back and uh, and uh, and capture the losses that you're seeing now in, in you know you're, you're purchasing electricity that you otherwise could be producing at your own plant and we summarize the cost there I have a pretty high level of confidence in what we did in terms of uh, of, uh, of uh, computing that number John again with John's help he gave us your your uh, your actual rate picture your your capacity and your your energy revenue uh, rates. So we, we arrived at those numbers. And um, our recommendation, I think, you know, we, we, we also understand or, 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 you know, we're in the business of overhauling equipment. Uh, we, we think that uh, you, could, you could overhaul these units for about $400,000 each. Um, we haven't worked up a formal price on that or a quote, but just to give you a sense for what we think it is, that would include the uh, 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 replacement of the controls, which are much of that is obsolete, and uh, and we think it's uh, we think it's uh, we think that number is is uh, based on your losses here. We think that number, um, at least to us, it doesn't it doesn't sound like it's that that far of a stretch um, in terms of justifying that. So that's it, that's it in a nutshell. Um, John, I don't know if you had anything to add specifically, but I'd like to, I'd like to entertain any questions you have on what we, what we found and what we put together here. 
Mr. Mayor. I have nothing to add, but um, yeah, we'll wait for questions. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Vice Mayor Good. Yeah, um, just a question, Scott. Uh, can <clears throat> those uh, turbines be uh, done one at a time and have one of them still limp along while we're doing the other one and then then put the uh, rebuilt one online and then do the second one? That's an excellent question. And I, I think that would that would that would be a good approach. Um, there is some synergy to doing both. Um, but I, I also think that you, you could probably uh, limp along for a while with one of the units and and make a little energy. I mean, I you know, um, and do one, you know, one a year, maybe if, if you if you're thinking of doing that, um, that would be an approach. Um, I, I don't, I don't see any disadvantages to that other than uh, you might be, you know, you might be overwhelming the guys again, you, you know, the operating team trying to limp along and babysit a unit that just, you know, is, is plagued with problems, but good question. Any other questions from the com commission? Yeah, Commissioner Burr has his hand raised. Commissioner Burr. Yes, yeah, so to rebuild one of, the, one of these units, uh, how long are you talking that it would be down? Um, we, uh, we, from the time, from the time we, we tear into it to, to bring it back, commission it, probably within, uh, I would say within a, um, a four month period, maybe, maybe less. Okay, then what would our energy, energy loss be in that four months? Well, I, <laughs> right now it'd be zero uh, because the units so just aren't running. Um, oh, so the so would be totally shut down then. Yeah, I mean, jo maybe John could comment a little bit more on that, but you know, you're you, you just haven't you just haven't been running the units because they've been they've been there's been you know so many issues with them. So I I there I don't think there's much of an advantage. Um, Unless you could get one of the units running, um, um, but yeah, you, 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 that's an excellent question too because you know it's always asked what's what's our energy losses during during our outage, and uh, you want to know that. But in this particular case, you, you're there, you're already losing. You know your losses are already there because the units really aren't running. Well, didn't you say that uh, we were losing fifteen percent of our electrical capacity? Fifty percent. 50%. 50%. Oh, okay. That's yeah. quite a bit more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that it adds up to about a quarter of a million dollars a year in, in energy. So, wow. you know, it's nothing to, uh, I mean, that, that's, you know, we work on a lot of, HCMS works on a lot, a lot of large projects, you know, you, what you might want to do is go to our website and, and take a peek, but that's, that's a big number. I mean, that's, that's a big number for anybody. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Vice Mayor Good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, you say a uh, rough cost estimate was 400 grand and we're losing a quarter of a mil now. Um, so would that essentially be a two year payback for getting one of them uh, online? Is, it, is that uh, a reasonable uh, look at that? You know, we're going to spend four hundred thousand in two years. We get five hundred back. Um, so, is that reasonable? Yeah, that that's right. Is that the way to look at it? I mean, you know, you're looking at a capital expenditure. What's the ROI on that? You know, mm -hmm. um, so that was the question. Uh, do we get it back right away? You know. Yeah. So, to, yeah. To to really answer that question, um, you know, the 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 calculation is based upon on 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 water, right, and um, and rates, and of course also the reliability of the equipment. Those three things. So, um, take those each one at a time. Um, the water, um, you know, we, you've had such good water years, and it just, I mean, it's anybody's guess that that's going to continue. Um, now, um, so that, that's a variable that, you know, we all could guess at, but 
if we look back at the past few years, um, you know, we, we've had a lot of good water and, and, may, and that, that may continue. So that's, that's a variable, but with, with regard to the rate, I think John could, could comment on this. I think your rates have just been, uh, you know, you ha you've got a, a, a renegotiated rate. I think that's a, that number is a solid number, right, John? Right, and I, I want to point that out that these cost savings or the revenue that Scott's been talking about is based on our new MPPA uh, arrangement. So the capacity and energy rates are based on MPPA and not on what we had been paying to AEP. So had we still been on AEP, that payback would have been a whole lot faster. So it was because the rates were a whale of a lot higher, but uh, the estimate was based on our new MPPA contract. Right. And then, uh, and then the reliability of the equipment, I think, you know, that's, um, you know, we're HCMS, if, if, if we would be so fortunate to be awarded a contract like this, um, we, uh, we're known in the industry as, as uh, our reputation for quality. Uh, we just repaired, uh, did, did this very same, we do these overhauls quite often. We, we just finished um, two Voith Alice units in uh, combined locks, which is Kakana, Wisconsin, uh, for Kakana Utilities, a municipal. Uh, the only difference really is that they were a little bit later. They, these were maybe uh, eight, they were the late 80, 80s vintage, uh, years are uh, early 80s. Um, and they were a little bigger. They were three megawatt. They were maybe three three times the size of what what you have there. Um, but you know, re re our references are 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 readily available with regard to uh, you know the question is what's the reliability of the equipment after it's put back in service? What you want is you want you want to you want the car to run without having to stop and and do this and that to it. And uh, that's what we do. We we put it back to the OEM standard. And uh, you can expect to run the unit with again a few problems um, until 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 it runs its cycle again, which is about 30, 30 years is what these are designed for. Mr. Mayor, Commissioner Burr has his hand up. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Uh, so the fifty percent is that fifty percent loss on each unit, or is that twenty five percent on one and? Uh, each unit. A good question. That's that's the total. That's both units. Okay. Yeah, both units. And, and they're not running and they're not running very well. So um, you're saying it's going to be a struggle for the other one to to be pro producing if we just pull one out at a time. Well, um, the more I, I've been thinking about that question again. Um, if it was me, I would do them both at the same time. If, if you had some reliability with, if you could count on some reliability, I would keep one in service and, and generate with one and do one, you know, one edit and sequence them. But in your case where you've got um, both of them down, both of them unreliable. Um, and, and again, with regard to the return on investment, I, I would want to get that back as soon as possible. Thank you. Commissioner Mullins has his hand raised. Commissioner Mullins. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a question for John, maybe. Last I understood, this hydro dam produced, you know, just like a single digit percentage of our power. Is that is that correct? That is. It's in, it's in the neighborhood of 2 to 3% of our total energy needs. And would that then take that number up to 4 to 6%? Well, I look back uh, several years ago, we were, Scott's estimate is 12 million kilowatt hours plus or minus with, with the rehab back 10 years ago, it was the plant would run about 10 million kilowatt hours. So it, would, it wouldn't it would double it uh, compared to the past history, but it would it certainly increase it maybe from three to five. And the other thing we look at is the offset, you know, how much has it been costing to operate the plant versus the offset on the power supply side. and uh, every year I've looked at it, it's always been in the black, except for a couple of years, we used it for water, but it, it, it wouldn't put it up, I don't think, to 6%. Okay, so the, the I'm taking it that, I mean, we are the electric city, so producing power is an important thing for us, and that dam is important in that regard, um, but do we, um, 
with the generation with the power that's going to be generated down at the solar uh, facility, that facility is going to be producing uh, how much in power? Fifteen. Well, it, it in the and the capacity side or the power side, Commissioner, it's fifteen megawatts. Okay. Um, which compared to two megawatts sounds like it ought to be a great deal, but percentage wise on energy, it's going to be around 12% just because it's when the sun shines. So even though the capacity is much larger, the energy is 12% compared to 3% um, now and maybe five or 6% with the hydro. So uh, we're, we're estimating 12% of the needs from the solar. Okay. And, and so the total usage by this, by the city, uh, I guess is what? As far as megawatts, you uh, megawatts. Our, our historical peak is fifty. We're we're probably closer to forty megawatts now with all the things from two thousand eight and nine and everything else that's hitting us. So we're our, our peaks uh, system load is is down, but it's uh, hanging around 40, 42 megawatts. Okay. Do we have any uh, incentives for producing hydroelectricity at all? I'm not aware of any. If, if we had maybe some tax benefits, if we were a taxable entity, but I'm not aware of, uh, of anything that's a benefit to us. We do get the renewable energy credits that's uh, mandated by the state that provides for that. But because of our load, we end up buying a fair amount of those anyway, but it, it does help offset those. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's uh, considered green. There's, uh, there's a lot of, I think, still local pride in having that plant there. Um, so, but I'm not aware of any any other benefits at this point. Okay, I, I mean, in, in no way do I say get out of uh, you know hydro at all, but it just seems like for the tiny amount that we're generating, it doesn't seem like it's that uh, critical. But you know, when you talk start talking numbers, and we're losing out on a quarter million dollars a year in revenue, um, mm -hmm. it sounds like something should be done. So. Yeah. Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess uh, this was uh, directed at Commissioner Mullins. Uh, when I was originally listening to his questions, I thought, are you leading into trying to get out of the hydro business? But then you uh, you came away from that at the end. So uh, uh, I, think, I think it's uh, prudent for us to continue in the hydro business, but... Uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a capital expenditure, John. I'm guessing you're going to be uh, bringing us uh, some sort of uh, a plan in the future here. And uh, tonight we're getting um, our initial education on that. Is that correct? Yes. And at, at first I was in the write-up, I, I put that we would be looking at that in the next budget year. So we're, we're looking well a year out. But the more I talked with Scott, the more I think we probably want to take a hard look at doing something sooner. So what the intent would be is to fine tune some numbers on, on the rehabilitation and go over the return on investment and, and the payback, then bring something back to you for your consideration. Okay, and, and while I'm still on, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, John Griffith, uh, you don't see any reason now that uh, Scott and his company have had this exposure um, you're not looking at uh, bidding on this uh, rebuild, or do you think it's something prudent to do? Or, Scott, would you think it's something prudent to do? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we, we've I've gotten to know John a bit and getting to know all, all you a little bit as well here. I think John and I have got a good relationship. I mean, we, we, uh, yeah, we, we would we would love to come in and do the work for you, but you know I, I don't know what your you know what your your protocol uh, protocols is for um, for spending this kind of money. Um, you know if you need to have three qualified bids. I I did put in the uh, in the write up there that there are several firms in the hydro industry. Well, <laughs> I don't know if there's several. There's a there's a couple. Um, that I would say are very, you know, HCMS, I, who I work for, I believe is very qualified, but it's, it's really a niche. These, these adjustable bladed units, um, uh, obviously the OEM, Voith, they, they would be qualified to, to do this kind of work. 
Um, so, you know, it's, it's really up to the to council as to how you'd want to proceed, but we, we would be happy to put a proposal together and, um, and give you some firm numbers and let you know what, what, what it would take for us to do it. Uh, we we're you know, we, we find ourselves kind of, uh, you know, we HCMS, I mean, we're, we're not, we're not, we don't manufacture anything. We're not, we're not in that business. We're just in the service consulting and service business. So we feel that we're, we're more economical and we also feel that we're, we've got a, a better sense for, um, um, you know, I, 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 customer relationship, uh, you know, s customer s service. I think we, we do a better job at that. I don't want to try to toot my horn, horn here too much, but I, you know, we'd be happy to, to do whatever the, the council would ask us to do in terms of a proposal. Don, did you want to add something to that? Uh, only that as a part of the next step would be to talk about that with Mike and Holly and get some sense of what would be done um, as far as a proposal or, or just having HCMS do the work. So we'd want to, I think, uh, debate that a little bit and see what the best approach might be and then bring something back to you. But right. I, I do appreciate Scott's time there for would they came recommended from, again, the Midwest Hydro Users Group. And that's a, I'm not sure how many people are how many firms and municipalities are in that organization, but uh, the professional engineer I talked to at that airs was uh, 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 Scott came very highly recommended from her. Oh, thank you, John. Yeah, we have about a hundred hundred members in our in in our Midwest group. Um, but and just to give you a sense for how how that would work, um, if you if you did um, one disadvantage of of having to bid it out, you would have to come up with a, a scope of work. And, and we could help you with that because obviously we know we know what to do. But um, again, these units are there's a fair amount of complexity, and 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 uh, we we could work through that with you as well and come up with the right scope. You know, one of, one of the things that that had you know like, like I was mentioning earlier, the guy, the guys have done a few things, and what we would like to do is respect that. Um, you know, they have replaced some things, and and so I I wouldn't look at it as being a you know, re, you know, refurbish a typical refurbishment. You know, where you you go through everything. You certainly would go through it, but I I think there are some things, some value to what's to what has been done, and, and I think we're in a unique position to to uh, to help you with that. And then also, I want to mention that and this this is just ironic, but uh, the gentleman, his name is John Epley, and he worked for Alice Chalmers at the time and he he was the one who installed the two units you have and he he's working with us with hcms and and he would be available to come and and um and and be the and, and manage the project I, I think that's a big advantage and also um i talked to john a little bit about this too uh we could provide some training it's one of the things that hcms does is we would um you know, kind of, it's kind of a byproduct of the of the uh, overhaul. But we we would we would we would like to have John's guys participate to some degree and understand more about the machine and troubleshooting and and just going forward. I think I think that'd be a value to to you as well um, to have your oper operating team uh, more knowledgeable about the equipment. So there's a couple of I think real advantages that HCMS could provide uh, for you. Good. Commissioner Mullins has his hand raised. Commissioner Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just one last quick question, John, is, uh, you know, we saw a, a, you know, a dam failure over in Midland area and that kind of thing. I'm just wondering, what was the last time that this thing was tested structurally? And um, did Scott have anything to do with that portion of things or just the pump houses? Uh, the... The, the project is licensed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and they have a whole host of things we have to do for compliance. Um, we have monthly reports that the guys fill out and send in. We're annually inspected by uh, an engineer out of Chicago Regional Office, uh, spends a day here, writes up reports, and tells us what we have to do, and there's some other projects coming. So uh, we have somebody there at least once a year from the FERC to take a look at structural integrity, and for that portion, we use Lawson and Fisher Associates out of South Bend, and they're the ones that help us review and, and uh, have license compliance. And they look at things like stability, 
stuff flow, like gen flow design, flood, and all that sort of thing. So uh, we're, I think we're in good shape there structurally. And Scott has not been a part of that. He's He's been more uh, helping along with the machinery, the controls, reliability, and, and things internal to the plant. So if this thing were to go through and uh, we were get this these repaired, we'd have no problems moving forward structurally then with the dam itself. Uh, no, there are some some capital projects that are coming, but they're unrelated to the work that we're looking at having Scott and HCMS do. Cool. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Any other questions, Andrew? Nothing from the commission. All right. Uh, well, we, let's just open it up to the public, see if there's any questions out there from them. Okay, so this would be those attending via the Zoom meeting. Um, if you're calling in, and I do see we have one person calling in, uh, you can use the raise your hand feature by dialing star nine for those on a computer or an iPad. There should be a raise hand button at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, depending on uh, your operating system um, to raise your hand. If you wish to make public comment, I will give people an opportunity to do that now. This would be for this particular topic. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Scott, lost you here. Thank you for all the work you've done uh, uh, with John. And John, thank you for the work you've done here. The next item. Thank okay, thank you all. Thank you both. Uh, the next item is the visitor section. Is there any visitors on our in our audience that have, would like to bring something to the commission that is not on our agenda. So once again, I will just uh, say to anybody attending via the Zoom meeting, if you wish to make a comment uh, on something that is not on tonight's agenda, please use the raise hand feature to be recognized. Once again, if you're dialing in via phone, you can use the raise hand feature by dialing star nine. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Andrew. Um, the next item is approval of the agenda. I will take a, a motion to approve our agenda for tonight. I wonder if Skip is trying to say something. He's not there. He's um, he's unmuted now. Am I not unmuted now? You are. Yeah. I move for approval for that agenda. Support, Support. Commissioner Burr. Thank you. Um, I have a motion by uh, Commissioner Klinger, support by Commissioner Burr uh, to approve the agenda. On um, uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Malone. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner Mullins. Yes. Commissioner Wickey. Yes. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Lippman. Yes. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. And Mayor Heil. Yes. Thank you. Um, now I'll also take a, a motion to approve our consent agenda for, the, for this evening. Your Honor, I move for approval of to consent agenda for tonight, uh, Wednesday the uh, 12th. Second. I have a motion by uh, Commissioner Litton, a second by Commissioner Clare. Uh, to approve the uh, consent agenda. Uh, roll call, please. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. Commissioner Lippman. Yes. Commissioner Malone. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Commissioner Wickey. Yes. Commissioner Mullins. Yes. Mayor Heil. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is unfinished business. There is nothing under it, so we'll go down to the uh, next item, which is new business. The first item on our agenda is the Jim Gill Family Concert Event Request. Um, Andrew. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Commissioners. Um, staff for the Great Start Collaborative, which is a program of the St. Joseph County Intermediate School District, recently approached us about uh, holding an event, a free family concert uh, with Jim Gill at Oak Lawn Terrace Park in the Bandshell. Uh, the event's scheduled for uh, August 20th at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, the group would need the area around the Bandshell uh, starting at 5.30 for setup. Um, including your packet was a flyer for the event, uh, a concert by performer Jim Gill. I think this is targeted at uh, younger audience members. 
Um, talked a little bit with the Great Start Collaborative about how uh, they would uh, look to meet the executive directives for social distancing and gathering size in your packet. We kind of outlined those. They were very, very much willing to, to look into those things. They're planning on roping off the seating area, um, doing some advanced ticketing, uh, free ticketing for people looking to come so that they keep themselves at the 100 person gathering limit. And then also using some uh, some paint that you would use to like mark a, mark a field to kind of cordon off areas and make sure people are socially distanced. So um, they're not planning on putting any food or drink. Um, they're gonna make masks and hand sanitizers available. Um, so they're looking for use of the park uh, and electrical service and staff is recommending approval. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Andrew on this event? Request. I do see Commissioner Wiki's hand raised. Commissioner Wiki, please. Um, I just, I could very well be wrong on this, but uh, as far as the outside attendance of uh, an event, um, last I heard it was 250. Did that change since um, it, recently? It's 250 up in regions six and eight. So that's Northern Michigan and the UP. I believe it was always set at a hundred down here. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. And the, and the, the laws where that was referenced, I think were very confusing because there was one, one uh, executive directive or executive order that had a bunch of stuff that pertained to us and had the 250 requirement, but the hundred person requirement was in a previous one. So very easy to be confused, but that's the, that's where we're at. See, Commissioner Good has his hand raised. Commissioner Good, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, do we charge for that amphitheater? And if so, is this a waiver because they're not for profit group? Um, typically, I don't believe we do have a charge for the amphitheater. We do for some of our park shelters. Um, typically, I just do a blanket waiver for the nonprofit groups when we bring a request like this. Um, so, Andrew, Andrew, there is a forty dollars fee usually for the amphitheater. Is there? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, most of the time I'm bringing stuff that uh, ends up getting waived, so I apologize for not having that one. And that's Vice Mayor Good. <laughs> apologize for the uh, demotion. Sorry, Don. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Commissioner Burr has his hand raised. Commissioner Burr. Uh, thank you. Uh, I see the start time is 7 p.m. It doesn't have an end time. Is that uh, just assumed to be at 10 o'clock or is that? Yeah, I don't know if the flyer has it there. It, because it's tending for a younger audience, I wouldn't expect them to be there late into the night, um, you know, rolling the speakers. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Let me take a look and see if it's in the pack. It was not on the uh, flyer. It wasn't on the flyer either. Yeah, no. so, yeah. I I can I can make it clear that uh, we have a you know a, our noise ordinance and the limit of that so that they're aware of when that that needs to finish up. All right. Thank you. See, Commissioner Klinger has his hand raised. Uh, just to just to note on that event, the last time they had it um, was at the auditorium, and uh, actually the event only lasted about an hour and ten minutes. Uh, it was pretty short and sweet just because it was directed at such a young age group. They didn't want to string it out. So I don't see any issues with them creeping into the night or being too loud by any means. That would be what I'd expect, but thank you for that, Commissioner. Any other hands, Andrew? I see none from commission members. All right, thank you. Is there any, was there anyone from our audience who had a question on this or comment? Uh, Again, anybody in the audience, if you wish to use the raise hand feature to be recognized, be happy to uh, be happy to um, do that at this point. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Andrew. Um, seeing no other questions, uh, do we have a motion for this uh, event? Your Honor, this is Commissioner Burr. I move that the Sturgis City Commission approve the requests for the Jim Gill Family Concert on August 20th, 2020 as presented. Second. That was Commissioner Klinger, right? 
Yep. Thank you. Uh, motion by Commissioner Burr, seconded by Commissioner Schneider to approve the event. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Malone. Commissioner Malone. Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Mullins. Yes. Commissioner Wickey. Yes. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. Commissioner Lippman. Yes. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Mayor Heil. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the DDA Summer Cruise In and Eats event request. Andrew. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Downtown Development Authority is planning a car cruise in and associated activities in the downtown area on Friday, August 21st. Um, they're looking at having the closure of parking spaces on US 12 on street parking spaces um, from Clay Street to Monroe Street for classic cars to come park and, and kind of show themselves off. And also closure of North Street to have some food truck vendors. Uh, that's from US 12 to John Street. Uh, and then closing a portion of the parking lot there as we normally do for a turnaround. Uh, and then just use of barricades, cones, things of that nature, as well as police department support to help, uh, help affect the closure of the on-street parking. They're also planning on having some musicians kind of posted at various locations through the downtown. Those musicians are gonna be kept to a very small group and basically providing background or ambient, uh, ambient music for those walking around. The intent was to keep the event fairly spread out, decentralized, so as not to kind of trigger what would be considered a, a mass gathering of people in, in violation of executive order, but do give chan people a chance to come downtown, have some, some activity in the downtown area. Um, we I talked with uh, Ryan Conrad, the event coordinator for the DDA, uh, about social distancing measures. He plans on having sandwich board signs posted near the musicians uh, and also in, in select areas through the, through the downtown, uh, reminding people of that. Also making sure that queue lines for food trucks have six foot social distancing marks similar to what you're seeing at, the, at grocery stores, stores of that nature. Um, be happy to answer any questions on that if you have any. Any questions from our commissioners? Seeing Andrew not saying any hands are up. Any question from our audience? Comments from our audience? Once again, anybody who's on the Zoom meeting, if you wish to make a public comment on this topic, please use the raise hand feature on your Zoom meeting. For those dialing in, you can use star nine. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, do you want to add your note here, or do we want to get through with this issue? If, is if we can get through this motion, I, I'll, I'll uh, add the, the second piece of things, if that's okay. okay. I will take a motion for the DDA summer cruise and needs of that. Your Honor, this is Commissioner Burr. I move that the Sturgis City Commission approve the request for the DDA summer cruise in and eats as presented. Mullins will second. Thank you. Have a motion by Commissioner Burr, second by Commissioner Mullins, to uh, approve this this uh, agenda item. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Mullins. Yes. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Commissioner Malone. Yes. Commissioner Wiki. Yes. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner Lippman. Yes. And Mayor Heil. Yes, thank you. Andrew wanted to add something to this. Uh... Yeah, we had a, a late breaking uh, late breaking activity that uh, would need commission consideration. I have uh, Sheila Bolda here, Executive Director of Sturgis Young Center for the Arts with me. Um, Sheila, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and bring your video up. Um, I sent something out this afternoon in, to you via email. So I, if you didn't get it, I apologize. But uh, they're planning on having Honey Creek, a uh, local band performing outside at the auditorium uh, here coming up uh, on Saturday, August 22nd, starting at 7.30. Uh, plan on having some drink specials and kitchen canteen items like Coney Dogs and barbecue sandwiches. 
Uh, they're looking to expand their liquor license for the event uh, to allow outside service. Um, as we'll learn in a, in a later topic, uh, one thing the city does have is an, is an ordinance that uh, prevents the sale or consumption of alcohol on public property without uh, approval of the city commission. And so because this would be a special event license expanding the auditorium's uh, liquor sales area and it is city property, um, we're asking for commission approval um, to do that. We're gonna, gonna ask for approval on the property of 201 North Ottawa, which would be uh, the auditorium itself, and then 202 East West Street. Uh, I don't believe Sheila will actually need this area, but it just gives her a little buffer space. This is uh, the property to the immediate east. Um, it, part of the parking lot back behind the auditorium that you, you kind of all think of is included on that parcel. So it just gives a little uh, buffer zone for Sheila as she sets things up. Sheila, I don't know if you had anything to add uh, on the event. Uh, not really. It'll go from 7.30 to 9.30. Um, I don't anticipate it being overly loud. It is Honey Creek. They're kind of folksy. So um, in terms of noise ordinance and whatnot, the closest residents would be on West Street. Um, and again, they'll be done by 9.30. And we will be kind of blocking off the parking lot so it won't be a drive-through area. Um, to ensure safety of our guests that are back there. Um, yeah. Any questions from the commission? Any question from the commission for either Sheila or Andrew? Probably for Sheila more than anybody else. I don't see any hands raised, Mr. Mayor. All right. Are there, is there any questions from our audience? Does, anyone, does our audience have any questions? Uh, audience members, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand feature at this time. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Uh, at this time, I will say, is there, is there I don't, I've got, don't have enough devices to see this. Do you have a written proposal? Sure, I can, I can read my staff recommendation if you'd like. So okay. it would be the... Yeah, and then if <laughs> And we'll get a second. Go ahead, Andrew. It would be to, to move that the commission approve and or deny uh, the use of city owned property at 201 North Nottawa, 202 East West Street for the sale and consumption of alcohol contingent upon a permit from the Michi from Michigan Liquor Control. So oh, I support this. Second. Okay, okay. Well, who made the first one? That, was it Vice Mayor? Yeah. Yeah. Vice, Vice Mayor, yep. And who seconded it? Oh, it was Commissioner Klinger here. Okay, I have a motion by uh, Vice Mayor Good and second by C Commissioner Klinger on this issue. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Littman. Aye. Commissioner Mullins. Yes. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner Malone. Yes. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Commissioner yes. Wickey. Yes. Mayor Heil. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the fiscal year 2020-21 budget, and it is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing hearing at this time. And Mike. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to take a moment just to share my screen. I have a couple of visuals that I want to bring up. So um, each year I do a budget presentation as part of the uh, adoption of the next fiscal year. And as you know, the each charter requires that the commission adopt a budget. Then the Uniform Budget Act requires that we have this public hearing before commission adopts its annual operating budget. Uh, so this public hearing will fill that requirement. A couple other items of note, um, the budget and appropriate appropriation resolution for fiscal year 2021 is in your packet. Uh, part of the budget development process is adoption of utility rates. The city code of ordinances requires that's done each year before September 1st. And so we're planning to bring electric rates uh, recommendation to you on August 26th. 
Uh, we already have approval from the city commission for uh, water and wastewater and those increases are included in the budget. What I try to do with my budget presentation, and this is really just an overall summary, is to kind of um, share information that I think people would be interested in and should know about what's going on with the budget. The budget is a document with a lot of numbers and for a lot of people when they open it up, um, you may have to sort through kind of what's really going on. So my effort is to kind of give some insight into what's going on in the budget and things we should be concerned about now and in the future. Uh, this first graph uh, just gives you a, a little bit of idea of kind of where we're at. And I guess I would say, um, I always kind of talk about a theme. I don't think I have to name that, but um, this year, you know, we're certainly thinking about uh, COVID-19 and its impact on our economy and budget and looking to the future. Uh, we're coming um, off of several years of a healthy local economy, uh, a city financial position that uh, certainly was recovering uh, for many years and overcoming quite a few struggles. So right as we kind of hit our stride from a financial standpoint, uh, this, this issue comes along and I expect that we're gonna be dealing with it for the next couple of years. So the unemployment rate, you know, obviously sometime middle of March, you know, we can see um, with the shutdown what that does to unemployment. And as things open back up in May, and of course we'll see in June, I think that that uh, unemployment rate would would lower as well. Long-term impacts, I think we have yet to see. Uh, so another indicator, sorry, ah, there we go. Another indicator of you know, one of the things we look at um, for local economic health is the number of properties that are for sale uh, per month. And um, we know if we go back previous to 2017, that, that decade prior, um, we would average somewhere, you know, mid 150, 200 houses, depending on what's going on uh, each year. And so as that, that inventory of houses per sale has declined, um, it's caused some other issues with housing demand, both good and bad. I mean, I think the good thing is, you know, values stabilizing, creating demand for new construction. But at the same time, employers would tell you that um, they struggle to recruit people and, and uh, there's a lack of housing options available in the area. Another indicator, I think, of you know, local economic health uh, is building permit, not just the um, number of permits, but revenue. So this chart shows you from 2009 to 2019 what that looks like. Uh, and I would say that if you go, even if you go before 2009, you would see similar permit counts. So, you know, over the past 10 years, we've progressively seen an increase in the number of permits, which would, means we have more construction and uh, reinvestment in the community. That, that's the entire spectrum that would include residential, uh, commercial and industrial. The, the revenue I think is worth looking at, uh, but it could be a little bit deceiving. The, the spikes that you see are, are really a result of large projects. So the way that we charge for permits is based on the construction costs. So 2015, 16 probably would include projects like Meyer and, and some of those other projects on South Centerville that were of higher construction cost. So as I mentioned, um, you know, COVID-19 is on everybody's minds and we're thinking about that as we put the budget together and, and it, it's having impacts now and will have impacts in the uh, foreseeable future. Uh, one of those areas I, I think we can expect and we're anticipating a decrease um, in this budget and probably future budgets is Act 51 money, which uh, funds our major and local street funds um, this is interesting because prior to 2016, I'd say the early 2000s, um, we were seeing decreases in Act 51 funding 
there's a whole history of the state kind of grappling with how to fund streets in Michigan. But we see um, in 2016, we're starting to see increases in that funding in kind of a variety of different ways, but um, some of it um, funded through general fund and then other changes in gas tax. Um, but we, we've went from a, a financial position in those funds that was not good um, to fairly healthy in this period of time. Um, but I think we're gonna endure at least a few years of uh, decreasing revenue. Uh, so, you know, number one, this is gas tax revenue, mobility and people traveling obviously is less. Some of these funds were distributed from the state's general fund. Um, and, and as I expect that they're trying to solve what they've estimated as a $3.2 billion shortfall, $2 billion in the general fund, that some of this might be what was directed to Act 51 might go somewhere else. So some of this is unknown, but I, I think it's fair to say that we could see some decreases in Act 51 monies. Um, you know, another area that's been um, directly impacted would be some of our special revenue funds like uh, Sturgis Young Center for the Arts and Adult Community Center. They are um, either closed down or, or barely operating because of governor's uh, executive orders and the type of businesses that they are, business operations that they are. Uh, so we, you know, we have, uh, to the best of our ability, accounted for that and how we're estimating and um, looking at that for the next fiscal year. But so much is in, up in the air. We're probably going to have to be, you know, making changes um, as we go on. So uh, those operations, I believe, were shut down in, in uh, mid-March. Doyle membership revenue, which is, I think is the largest revenue uh, line item. Um, right now, we're not collecting memberships. We're deferring those uh, for those members since they can't receive the benefit. And so we expect that, that um, that's probably going to have to have an impact in next year's fiscal year budget. Let's see what next. Okay. A couple other things I wanted to mention before I get to this uh, slide, just really worth noting, and, and I know you're well, well aware, uh, we're transitioning from a full requirements wholesale power contract to a joint ac action agency model, which means we're gonna be purchasing power on the market managed by the Michigan Public Power Association. Uh, this is pretty significant and I think it's gonna have long-term and short-term benefits to customers. Um, and that's something really worth pointing out. Uh, we started that this fiscal year, next fiscal will be our first full fiscal year uh, going to that new, that new model. Um, so I wanted to just mention the tax rate. That's always critical. Uh, we have a city operating at 10.4623, an additional three mills dedicated for streets. Uh, we always like to benchmark ourselves. This is a, there's a whole lot of cities on here. These are cities in Southwest Michigan. We, we even uh, when we added the three mills for streets compare favorably uh, to other cities in, in Southwest Michigan. And I think Sturgis, not only since the time I've been here, but historically has done a very good job, a very good job with that. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea of what our uh, revenue makeup is in the general fund, we have this pie chart to look at. Uh, so, and, and most people may not be aware that, you know, only 27% of our revenue in the general fund comes from property taxes. We of course talk quite a bit about revenue sharing, which has declined as an overall percentage over the years at that 11%. The uh, local community stabilization authority uh, revenue, that is uh, what we've referred to as replacement for personal property tax. That's become a pretty significant part of the overall revenue mix for the, for the general fund. And then of course our, our uh, pilot or payment in lieu funds that our utilities pay somewhat like, uh, like a business would pay property taxes. Uh, so just to mention overall revenue at uh, eight 
uh, $8.9 million for the general fund. We have a 2.6% decrease programmed in for the pilot. And that's partially because we've had you know, flat revenue in the utilities. And then also um, revenue sharing, looking at a 5% decrease uh, for 2021 at, at about uh, 997,000. Again, that same pie chart for expenditures for the general fund. Uh, so if you see the, the blue and the red, 33% and 18, that's police and fire. Uh, the overall you know, expense is for public safety and the general fund is 51%, which is actually quite typical um, for a city our size, but it's a significant expense, um, obviously in the general fund. Uh, so looking at, you know, total general fund expenditures, operating expenses at $7.5 million after contributions to other funds and capital, uh, we're looking at about uh, $9 million of total expenditures. The important part here is that we're maintaining a fund balance of 26.68%, uh, which as a policy, uh, we target 25%, 25% uh, fund balance. So we are in uh, pretty good shape there. Ooh. Boy, that's a sensitive trigger. Um, utility consumption, as I just mentioned, uh, that's been pretty flat. Um, I don't think it's, it's really uh, should be a surprise because um, the only way I think you'd see, you know, significant increases in consumption would be through um, some substantial growth. So when, even when we have growth, uh, for most utility customers, they're interested in paying less. So they do things to save on electricity and save on water. And that's, that's certainly happened over time. But it's important to kind of understand that as you're thinking about rate design and and making sure that those utilities fund themselves. Uh, this is a pretty big one I, I point out, and that is um, most recently we've had this significant additional capital cost in the water fund lead service line replacement. So in 2021 or fiscal year 2021, uh, we're budgeting $400,000, uh, but over time, I, and of course experience in what this cost is, will inform what we do over time, but we're budgeting uh, $250,000 a year. That's, that is a significant expense for the water fund. And this comes from a mandate from state of Michigan um, Eagle, uh, which is requiring cities to uh, change out uh, private uh, service lines to try to eliminate uh, lead as part of those municipal water systems. But um, this, is, this is really important to understand and why kind of at least one uh, considerable variable in, in what's causing um, water rates to increase. We have uh, quite a few capital projects programmed. We have some facility improvements for Sturgis Young Center for the Arts, uh, Dolo Community Center, Police Fire Building, I wanted to point out our major street projects. So in 201, we have the East Congress Street, Vinewood Avenue project. This is uh, uh, MDOT's uh, grant. So you can see down at the bottom in 2021, that, that grant of $375,000, uh, that comes from um, MDOT Small Urban Program. And then um, our portion, the city's portion, the street is $126,500. Our other significant uh, street reconstruction project is West Congress Street from Clay to South Centerville. And that project is uh, real close to 1.3 million. Let's see. Well, before we get there, I wanted to mention, I mean, we do have uh, significant capital projects for electric, wastewater, and water. 
course, we're looking at distribution replacement, substation upgrades. Uh, we still have the rural transmission line project for the wastewater treatment plant, implementing our asset management plan. We have collect collection system rehab, plant improvements, and then water main. Besides the uh, lead service replacement, we also have water main replacement um, on uh, West Congress Street. I always like to mention OPEB because this was a major issue and through work from city commission and city staff, uh, we've done um, really well to improve this situation. And so you can look back at, uh, you know, 2013 and you could see, you know, our um, actual obligation that a little over, well, over $20.5 million and then what we had put in the OPEB trust at 2.5, that gap between was our unfunded liability and it was substantial. So we've done a lot of different things um, to improve that over time, funding the trust fund, making um, plan design changes. And so, you know, in 2019, we've really um, brought that unfunded liability down we're at a little over 1.7 million. Our ARC has dramatically decreased and that is uh, $260,000 now. So we are now, I think at one point we were 4% funded and now um, we're at, I think our last, last actuarial report, 83% funded. Um, so I, I um, like to mention that because it's been a big project and and I think quite successful. Uh, that's really the um, summary of the fiscal year 2021 budget. I want to thank um, Holly and Ken and Andrew for all the work that they do. Department heads as well, they, they are responsible for putting together their budgets through our process. So there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. Uh, I want to thank the commission as well uh, for your involvement, your guidance, and direction and, and uh, the work we do in the budget work sessions, it takes all of us to bring it together. So thanks so much and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Okay, Michael, you're gonna have to take your sharing off so I can see the commission. Sure. Um, that's Very probably scary. the button that says stop share. Got it. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, Andrew, any hands up here? Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Vice Mayor Good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, not a question, really. Just a statement, um, personal statement. Uh, the graph that we saw with regard to general fund expenditures uh, showing that 33% uh, of our general fund expenditures go toward police and fire. I personally would uh, reject any reduction in that. Uh, no reduction in funding the police or fire. Just a personal uh, comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Andrew, any other hands? See none right now from the commission. Okay, let's go to, the, to our, uh, is there anybody in our audience? Yes, we do have our audience members. So if there's a member of the audience attending via the Zoom meeting, uh, you can use the raise hand feature on Zoom uh, to be recognized and we'll uh, bring you forward to make a public comment. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Andrew. And again, I'm gonna ask if there's any other commissioners that have any questions on this for Michael. If not, I'm going to go ahead and close this public hearing. The only comment I will make is thank Michael and his staff for the great job that they do putting this together for us. Um, I will take a motion on this item. Your Honor, this is Commissioner Mullins. I move that the Sturgis City Commission adopt uh, the 2021 annual uh, City of Sturgis budget summary and appropriation resolution and approve the City of Sturgis fee schedule as presented. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor Good, I'll support that motion. Thank you, sir. I have a motion by Mr. Mullins and a second by Vice Mayor Good. 
uh, on the adoption of the uh, 2021 public uh, but uh, excuse me uh, budget. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner Malone. Commissioner Malone, now you're muted. Yes. Yeah. Can't hear you. Got it. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Yes. Commissioner Mullins. Yes. Commissioner Littman. Yes. Commissioner Wickey. Yes. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. And Mayor Heil. Yes. Uh, motion carried. The next item on our agenda is the downtown social district and commons area public area. And it's also the public hearing. I will open this public hearing. And Andrew, it looks like you're doing a presentation on this. Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Commissioners. Um, Public Act 124 of 2020, which was signed into law this July, established a new section of the Michigan Liquor Control Code that authorizes the creation of social districts and common areas by local governments. Uh, under the law, if we have people with qualified uh, liquor licenses whose licensed premises are one, contiguous to one of these common areas, uh, within a social district and two have been issued a social district permit by Michigan Liquor Control. Uh, they are allowed to sell to individuals who can then take it outside of the, their permitted premise, outside of the, the business's permitted premise into the commons area in order to consume it. So basically it creates an area where people can walk outside, uh, even go into other businesses uh, with, uh, with liquors or beer sold at uh, a licensed establishment. Um, part of what we have to do to establish one of these areas is to create a downtown social district plan, uh, setting the social district, then setting a common area where people could conceivably walk through. Uh, draft plan was included in your packet. I'm gonna share my screen real quick so we can kind of talk about what we're proposing for this area. Um, hopefully you can see on your screen the uh, downtown social district outlined. You can see that it generally is in the downtown area, as one might expect, um, kind of bordering the railroad tracks to the west. Uh, let me shrink my participant screen. Uh, the edge of North 4th Street uh, to the east. The north side is pretty variable, but uh, the, the northernmost point is just, just north of the auditorium here, kind of encompasses the auditorium, some of our city property up there, uh, and then kind of comes down, down from there. On the southern board boundary, it basically cuts a half a block uh, south of Chicago Road, US 12, um, and encompasses, encompasses that. Um, Within this social district, you business or communities can designate one or more uh, what they call commons areas, and that's that's the area where you can actually go out and uh, and, and drink uh, and drink in. Um, one of the key factors in establishing a social district and common area is that it needs to be contiguous to two license holders. Um, we only have two in this area right now that are active. One is the auditorium itself. The other is Wings, et cetera. And we do have uh, Gene Harrison here from uh, Harrison Investment Properties as well as uh, Wings, et cetera, to, to chime in and kind of kind of talk about what this might mean for his business uh, in a little bit. Um, but so we have those two. So when we're kind of putting together our common area, we really only have one and it's gonna encompass everything else. Um, if you look at a larger community like a Grand Rapids or a Kalamazoo, sometimes they'll have their social district and then two commons areas uh, within that social district. Um, looking at what we're proposing for the commons areas, we're actually doing something that isn't necessarily envisioned in the law. We're going to see how Michigan Liquor Control uh, kind of reacts to it, but uh, it uh, we create a general common area. That's the area marked in blue on this map. Uh, it includes the auditorium property, uh, Free Church Park, the area kind of behind the behind wings, etc. in that block, and then a network of, of sidewalks uh, through the downtown area that will allow people to travel uh, throughout downtown. We then have what we're calling sub areas that will become active under certain conditions. So we have one uh, 
that expands the auditoriums, uh, the auditoriums area if they wanted to do larger events, covering some of that property, uh, the area covering lot four uh, behind wings, et cetera, again, uh, the area on North Street, John Street, and then Pleasant Avenue. Um, the way we kind of envision these is the blue area is open all the time, and we'll talk about the hours that we're proposing in the plan. Um, the sub areas are activated when the commission approves an event. So for example, um, Sheila's auditorium event, rather than, uh, rather than get a special liquor license, she could have sold out of the auditorium. Uh, we activate the, uh, the sub area for the auditorium and then people can walk anywhere in this area with, uh, with their alcohol sold out of the auditorium by their normal liquor license. Um, same thing with Pleasant Street, if we, or excuse me, North Street, if we have an event down there, we can activate that sub area. And if we don't want to have an actual beer tent set up or something like that, people can buy a beer from Wings and then walk down and enjoy whatever activity is going on. Um, we do also envision the ability to cross streets. Uh, we, we have a little section in there that talks about when you're crossing a street, it's, it's part of things, but you have to... Uh, you know, follow the rules of crossing the street and then, uh, you know, all that type of thing. Um, talked about our sub areas, talked about our licensees. There would also be several businesses that are ineligible to allow alcohol on the premise. So uh, if I sell from, from Wings, et cetera, and I want to walk downtown, many businesses, you could walk into those businesses if they allow you to uh, with, your, with your cup. Um, some businesses that's not allowed. There's state law that prohibits any area that sells food. So you couldn't necessarily take a beer from Wings, et cetera, into Mike's Pizza uh, or the Corner Cafe or Five Lakes. Um, and then there may, there's also a prohibition against taking it from one, uh, one social district licensee to another. So I can't take my beer from the auditorium and walk down to Wings, et cetera, and grab a table and drink it inside uh, Wings, et cetera, or vice versa. Businesses that do want that are eligible to allow alcohol on the premise again that that could be many of the many of the downtown shops. Um, we envision allowing them to kind of choose whether they're going to permit that to, to happen with their uh, with their business and if they if they do want it, we would give them a window cling or something that they could identify themselves and uh, and show that they're open for that for that service. Um, I'm going to stop my share just. We can bring it up if we need it, but um, the hours of operation we're envisioning uh, open all year round, seven days a week. Uh, from the earliest time a participating social district permit holder opens for alcohol sales, and that's part of the law, until 11 p.m. That would be when you could actually actively circulate in the commons area. Uh, we would ask then that sales of downtown social district beverages by the, by the licensees end at 10 p.m., that just gives some time for people to get a get a beverage, go outside and walk around, but not like grab one, run out, and then immediately not be able to walk around outside. Um, that's in the general commons area. The sub areas, as I mentioned, would only be activated uh, during certain days for the, the North Street, John Street, and Pleasant Avenue. That would be by commission approval, um, and their active hours would be the, the limit of that permit or our limit of commission approval or the commons areas hours, whichever are more restrictive. Uh, for Sturgis Young Center of the Arts, approval would come from the Center for the Arts Board. That would just uh, limit the need to go to the commission for those type of activities if they're planning active events. Um, and then for lot four, uh, much like the streets, it would be city commission approval and closure. Um, Commons area beverage container identification. So in the state law, they require that the beverage containers sold by a licensee uh, contain a logo of the commons area that is that the business is located in and then the business's logo. Uh, we're gonna be trying try to be very flexible, design something that can be provided to um, both the auditorium and uh, wings, et cetera. Um, in whatever form they want to do. So if they want to print print cups from direct from a manufacturer, we can do that. Or if they want to do labels or something, uh, something else, uh, that's also an option too. One thing we do want to work with them on is design the format of the container. 
hopefully get some type of unique color that will allow police officers to quickly and easily identify whether someone is uh, using an approved container or not. Um, and then as far as festivals and special events, just one note in the district plan uh, on this. If there is a special event liquor license, so for example, uh, Sturgis Fest and we have a beer tent anywhere in the social district, um, the commons area basically closes down. So you can't take a beer from wings out into the commons area while that special event license is active. Uh, if we're having an event downtown and there is no special liquor license out there, uh, obviously it would operate as normal and people could, could bring a beer. That gives us some flexibility. Um, you know, typically we're, we're trying to provide some type of beer tent or, or other alcohol sales for things like our music on North. Uh, that's a, that's a burden on us, um, in terms of staffing or the DDA in most cases or the chamber of commerce to, to find staffing, arrange everything. Uh, this way we could have very quick events, very simple events where we get entertainment and allow wings, et cetera, to, to sell and have people get their, get their alcohol sales that way. So, um, just make one, one more comment, uh, and then get to questions, um, this uh, kind of was envisioned mostly to help with COVID-19, uh, provide some extra area for businesses to spread out and have customers spread out as they're restricted on uh, who can be inside and how many people they can serve. So we're hoping that it's, it's not only something that'll be useful for that, but also something that's useful uh, going forward. Uh, it does have a sunset provision uh, that's set out for I believe 2024, 2025. And so we, we would have to review it at that time uh, one note, and it gets to the motion attached to this agenda item, our city code of ordinances does uh, currently prohibits consumption of alcoholic beverages in parks and on public property like sidewalks. Um, we have a proposed amendment that would create an exception for this. Uh, we're looking to do a first reading of that proposal tonight. Um, we would have a second reading next meeting, obviously, if, if it moves forward, and that's when we would approve a resolution uh, to adopt the plan and actually establish the districts. Um, that's a lot of me talking. Uh, so I will now turn it over to questions and I see Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Um, before I acknowledge Vice Mayor Good, do we wanna let Mr. Harrison talk about this, his, his uh, idea on this? Sure. I would like to do that. John, is that okay with you, uh, Vice Mayor Good? If I let Mr. Harrison speak first? I be fine with Mr. Harrison speaking before I do. Sir, uh, Gene, thanks for being with us tonight. Your comments. You do need to unmute, Gene. Hey, there. thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for having me uh, speak. This is a, a privilege. Thank you. Um, yeah, when this was brought to my attention, as you guys know, I own stores in multiple cities. Um, I've been watching this. Uh, transform over the last month and Port Huron actually got their approval just today. They sent out maps and uh, they have their uh, social area uh, approved by the state of Michigan. I think this is a, a really good thing. Obviously it's good for wings, but I think it's great for the community. When you look at, uh, you know, the festivals and some of the things that go on downtown are our stroll with the arts and whatever for someone to be able to take a glass of wine and actually enjoy it and immerse into it i think it's a good thing some of the things that port Huron did that uh, uh, were not talked about and i just saw the document today so uh, andrew i don't mean to bombard you but they did a couple of unique things which i liked so that sticker that you're talking about from the city the city of Port Huron put a 50 cent charge on it. So they're gonna provide the stickers. The places that are selling the alcohol will buy the stickers from the city. And that's a means of getting a little bit of uh, revenue to help with trash, trash bags, maybe even some of the problems you might have with the uh, police having to do a little bit of jurisdiction. Um, I'm all for it, I thought it was a great idea. And that again allows the cups to be known that they they were bought. So they're doing a uh, put your logo on the cup, but then you got a sticker that the city's providing that we pay for, which again provides a little bit of revenue 
to help uh, maintain this. So I'm in favor of that and I think it's good. The other thing that's important to talk about is they also put a no reuse on the cups. Mm -hmm. So therefore, every time one is purchased, um, you got to go in and uh, buy another one. So that 50 cents is being regenerated over and over. Um, I had a talk with their city manager just today on how do we make sure that people aren't running to their car and filling them because you don't want the whole thing to come to a crashing halt because cups are being reused. And uh, we're talking about actually using a Sharpie and putting the hour that it was filled on the cup. So it makes it easier for law enforcement to look at it and say, you've had this cup for six hours and it's still cold. That's an amazing cup, <laughs> you know? So uh, that might help in enforcement um, to make sure it's not being abused. But in general, I think this is something that helps the community in so many ways. And I'm, I'm glad to be involved if that's what it comes down to. I definitely will um, get with the MLCC and any licensing that's needed. Because the other one that uh, blends with this, and I don't know if you guys have been following the MLCC rulings, but they're now allowing liquor to go also. Um, and that's got to be in a sealed cup. So there's going to be a little bit of variables that just got to be maintained. And that sticker will definitely identify the difference between a liquor to go cup and a consumed uh, drink that's in the social district. That's about all I got to add, unless you guys have questions for me. All right. Thank you, Gene. Um, I think Vice Mayor Good, you did have a question. I don't know uh, if it's you or for Gene. Uh, for uh, Andrew, actually, uh, and it's really not a question. Uh, Andrew, you indicated a couple of uh, sub areas, and uh, uh, we talked earlier today about uh, the potential for a sub area that would throw the American Legion into the works, in that they are a licensee, albeit uh, an organization, I believe. Um, the uh, Liquor Control Commission does provide for them to apply for uh, outside licenses that for uh, public consumption during special events. I'm not um, saying I know that for a fact, but I believe that um, my experience has been when they have a specific event that uh, they can allow the general public to participate in their alcohol sales. So it's just throwing that out there for consideration of a sub area that might uh, kick in when you have a special event and then you have a third licensee available. Um, and you know, the Legion has always felt like they've been on the wrong side of the tracks um, <laughs> whenever things are considered. So uh, just something for you to consider. Yeah, would you be looking then obviously at extending the social district down all the way to the legion to, to well yeah i think that would be uh necessary for them to be a participant they'd want to have a an ability to have that common area so you could walk from there uh now some people have some people i know have indicated they might not want to be able to walk down that hill but uh i think some people can so anyway uh just something uh yeah You'd uh, extend those that blue area so that you walk down the sidewalk uh, across the tracks from Jefferson to to the Legion, and then uh, include that Legion uh, property as uh, one of those sub areas. Okay. See, Commissioner Klinger has his hand raised. Okay, uh, Commissioner Klinger. No, I, I just had some questions and thoughts on Gene's uh, considered idea of uh, time stamping the cups. Uh, obviously, having a designated cup for the downtown district, social drinking districts is important, and obviously making it indicated to, you know, represent that it is in fact an alcoholic beverage is also vital. But uh, knowing that most of those cups will be some sort of polyplastic, urethane, anything that's going to be um, washable. Uh, one time use or not, you know, uh, there's a chance of someone used, you know, taking advantage of that cold cup and rubbing that Sharpie. Uh, just some thoughts maybe of a, a like a sticker timestamp 
for your uh, business, Mr. Harrison. Uh, you know, something's out of a dyno timestamp, you know, very simple. Uh, it definitely could reassure uh, the enforcement of what you're looking at. Gene, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, one of the things, uh, Travis, that we're looking at in Port Huron, because uh, our bar is right on the water in Port Huron. My son's already looking at biodegradable cups, mm. again, from a trash standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, something like that would really uh, foil anybody trying to wash it and reuse it. That's so, good. So that might be, that might be an option, an option by itself. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, as far as that biodegradable effort goes, uh, obviously that's, that goes without saying that it still needs to be put in a trash can. So it definitely, <laughs> Definitely still needs to make it to the, the hole in the receptacle. So just a thought, but I appreciate your uh, mindfulness of the environment. I should note too, I, I didn't mention it. That there is a requirement for signage of the boundaries of the uh, commons area. Um, we do have provisions for that. I, there was a map included with the plan. Um, you can see there's quite a few signs that we would, we would do along the perimeter uh, of that. We're, we're doing our best as I looked at locations to try and keep that as limited as we possibly can while at the same time meeting the intent of the law, but also um, looking at locations that would allow us to put posts in, in turf instead of into asphalt or on existing poles as much as possible to reduce the amount of labor costs that would be necessary to put them up. I talked a little bit with Rick Miller about what he thought cost to actually purchase the signs and then install at the different levels. I, this is a rough, rough estimate, but I would say we're, we're looking at about $3,500 in that neighborhood for the signage uh, that would be necessary. And what about the added receptacles? I saw the map that we, were, we had put together for that as well. Um, is there, yeah. uh, are we looking at putting the receptacles out in the same fashion they are downtown with a metal created look with an overhang or, or with, you know, a cover, or is it just going to be a plastic barrel strapped to the sign, you know? Yeah, that's I'm just the, the trash, the trash, uh, the trash map is a little bit of a, a rough draft. I still want to get a little bit, okay. a little bit more detail with, uh, with Tony uh, from, uh, from the parts department who will be responsible for running those trash cans and putting them out and kind of look at trash can format, um, you know, how often he thinks we need to run, if that's a good number, if that's too many, that type of thing. So again, okay. locations with, with me trying to look at the, the boundaries and where it makes sense to have something. So if somebody's leaving the area, there's a trash can available and they don't feel to throw their uh, cup on the ground instead of in a receptacle, so. Great, great, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Pyatt. Um, I do have a quick question here, um, and Mr. Harrison sort of brought this up about the law enforcement, and I see that Jeff is with us this evening. Uh, Jeff, do you have a co any comments on this? Um, not really. I mean, a lot of different areas are experimenting or doing similar things, so I know there's been a lot of dialogue between Ryan and Andrew. Um, I think uh, Andrew addressed a little bit at the beginning on with our little bit variation. I don't know how LCC is going to, uh, if they're going to push back at all, but I think overall, I think it, it's a good idea just to, you know, boost some things downtown. Um, also the community in general. Um, could there be some issues and things like that? Sure. But um, with everything, you know, we run into those and then usually work through them. So. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Andrew, any other uh, hands here? Commissioner Mullins has his hand raised. Commissioner Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have uh, one comment for Andrew and one question for Mr. Harrison. Andrew, um, Mr. Harrison indicated that he is willing to pay for those stickers, so I suggest we put a higher price tag on it, maybe five bucks. And for <laughs> Harrison, yeah, I, I, I would. I, I'll just, I'll just say, I did see Port Huron's plan, and we, I looked at the idea of charging. I was, I was trying to do Gina solid and figure out a way we didn't have to charge him. But if he's willing to pay, I'm, I'm willing to charge him. So. No, he's, he's hard at fifty cents. I figured we could bump that up a bit. But uh, 
Dean, uh, Mr. Harrison, I was wondering about the uh, cups and that kind of thing. Is there or maybe Andrew can answer the question too? Is there only going to be one size cup because you guys sell shorts and talls, and I rarely buy a short when I'm in your place? Um, I second this top question. Would there be Jeff, would there be just one size cup for all the area, or would there be a couple different options? I would suggest that we just do a sixteen ounce option. Sixteen ounce option. I don't think we want people walking around with a quarter beer in their hand. Yeah, there's there's actually a limit, and I'm going to try and pull up the legislation. Oh, is there for the? Yeah. I'm quite. I'm you thinking it exceed. was limited sixteen ounces. I'm quite yeah. sure that that's what it is. It cannot exceed sixteen ounces. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But I'll sell you two. <laughs> Man. Any other uh, comments or questions here, Andrew? Any more hands? I see no other hands from the commission. All right. How about we open this up to the public? Uh, for members of the public attending via the Zoom meeting, if you wish to use the raise hand feature to be recognized, we will recognize you for public comment on this agenda item. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And again, one more one more time here. Are there any commissioners that have any other questions? Andrew or Mr. Harrison? No, nope, thank you. I see Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Vice Mayor Good. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I was noticing uh, at the beginning of this, uh, maybe I missed it, it says that this was an open public hearing. Did, um, did you open the public hearing, Mr. Mayor? Yes, I did. Okay, I, I I missed it, so I just double checking, checking up on you, Mr. Mayor, checking up on you. Sure, appreciate it. Thank you. Seeing no other questions or comments, I will uh, take a motion on this uh, agenda item. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing first. So I'm going to close the public hearing, and I'll take a motion on this item. Your Honor, I, Commissioner Mullins here. I move the Sturgis City Commission consider this the first reading of an amendment to the City Code of Ordinance, Part 2, Chapter 38, Article 5, Section 38-124, pertaining to consumption of alcoholic beverage in parks and public property as part of Commons area. Commissioner Burr, support. Yeah, a motion by Commissioner uh, motion Mullins. In support by Commissioner Burke, to approve this motion. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Levin. Your voice oh. is kind of mumbling up, but I'll say yes. Okay. Wow. Commissioner Wolinski. Yes. Commissioner Long. Ken, you're having some audio issues. Uh, don't, don't know what I guess. So, would you like me to do this, Ken? Um, yeah. If you can, if you want, I, uh, I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Someone, someone stop him. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, so I, I believe we had Commissioner Whitman. Was a yes? Commissioner Malone. <laughs> She's nodding her head. Okay, all right. We'll, we'll take that as a yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Good. Yes. Commissioner Mullins. Yes. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner <laughs> Wink. <-hoo>. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mayor Heil. Yes. Did I miss anybody? Did everybody? It looks like we did. Motion. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I um, it'll get back for us. I don't know why it would have me. But... <laughs> hey, Ken, if you if you have a separate microphone somewhere, you might want to try plugging that in. Like a, I think there's one by Julie's desk. <laughs> All right. Right. Moving on. Our next item on our agenda is the VFD equipment and installation bids. Rick Miller. We have to unmute you, sir. There. How's that? 
That's better. All right. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. Um, tonight, I wanted to uh, bring to you a request uh, to purchase some variable frequency drives for two of the city's four water wells. And uh, in 2011, we installed VFDs on uh, the Oaklawn well and the Thurston Woods well number seven, which was the, the most uh, recent well that uh, the city had put in. And uh, we did it uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, there is some savings um, as far as electrical consumption by using a, a VFD. And uh, we also had done some studies of our own and found that uh, when the pumps started and stopped, there's a, a hydraulic shock wave that travels through this, the uh, distribution system. And we can actually watch that with a pressure transducer um, at fire hydrants out on the system. And uh, we felt that this would be a way to uh, um, perhaps reduce that by um, using a, a soft start, soft stop function that uh, the VFDs can provide. And uh, that does seem to work and we have had some success. Um, so it's time to uh, take a look at the other two wells and uh, see if we can't put drives on those. Um, the Lakeview well is actually, that well was put in or installed or drilled in 1952 and uh, came online in the same year. And uh, the Thurston Woods well number six um, was drilled in 1989 and, and again put in online in the same year. So um, Lakeview well 61 or excuse me 68 years of service, uh, Thurston well 31 years of service. Um, the Lakeview well, the magnetic excuse me magnetic motor starter equipment uh, appears to be original. Uh, it was of course in 1952 they were built very robust and uh, it has held up amazingly well. We have had to do some uh, maintenance on that over the years to keep it in good shape, but uh, as you can imagine, there um, have been a lot of changes in uh, what can be done with electronics in that 68 year time period. So um, a lot of advantages to changing out this switch gear and uh, moving towards a, a variable frequency drive to be able to control the well pump. Um, in 2011, uh, as a means to try and save the city um, some costs, we, we put out a bid that was uh, broken down into two separate pieces. We wanted to try to buy the equipment uh, separately and then hire a contractor to do the installation. And uh, it worked very well at that time. So we, we did the same thing this time. Uh, bids were sent out and uh, we had uh, seven different uh, vendors uh, and contractors reply uh, with bids. And uh, five of those folks also provided um, a bid to do the installation. And um, the, the way it turned out, as far as uh, the recommendation goes, uh, Byler Electric provided the low bid for the installation and uh, Wood PLC slash CEC controls uh, provided the low bid uh, for the uh, materials and equipment. So I would be happy to try and answer any questions you might have, um, but that's uh, what we're asking for is variable frequency drives to replace the uh, switch gear in both of those wells. Okay, Andrew, you're gonna have to help me here. <laughs> All right. Uh... Two hands raised, Commissioner Wiki. Let's uh, identify Chris, Commissioner Wiki. Are you going to take these, this big chart off? I can. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Wiki. Uh, just had one question. Uh, what kinds of problems can arise from a hydraulic shock wave? What we had assumed may happen is that that may contribute to some of the water main breaks that we have, and. Uh, so the thought was that if we could soft start so that with a magnetic starter, it, it pulls in the magnetic starter right away 
the motor speeds up to full RPM and you get this column of water that comes up and goes through a check valves and then basically slams into the water that's in the system. And it, it kind of shocks that. And again, you can see that on a pressure transducer as that travels through the system, we could see it go to the end of the piping and then it would bounce back and it would do that several times. You can actually watch that. And uh, by being able to soft start and soft stop through um, varying the number of cycles and how quickly and how slowly that ramps up and down, we're able to, to provide the soft start, soft stop. Thank you. Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Vice Mayor Good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the typical question, is this a budgeted item? And uh, we also learned uh, in our little uh, budget presentation from the manager that uh, the water department is seeing some uh, serious changes in their expenses with regard to the uh, lead line replacements. Uh, so how is this impacting our water department? It, it is a budgeted item. We had budgeted $30,000 per well um, for this. And uh, it's coming in slightly under that. Um, total for both wells, $52,302. There will be some additional um, pumps and auxiliary equipment that, that we have to change uh, to make it work with the variable frequency drive. But um, some of those we have to get Number one, they're not terribly expensive. And number two, um, they're somewhat proprietary in nature and we have to get those from, from uh, not, not folks that uh, are on the electrical side of things, but chemical metering pumps and uh, booster pumps, those types of issues. So there will be a little bit more expense involved in all of this, but the major portion of the expense is here with the, the, the VFDs. Thank you. Uh, Barry, Barry has his hand raised, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Barry. Good, good evening, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, just want a quick question for my uh, Rick. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this. This is actually, isn't this slightly cheaper than what we did in 2011 as far as overall cost to do two wells? Um, actually, I think it's just slightly higher, Barry. I think total cost when we were finished um, in 2011 was around $51,000. The one thing that hasn't been taken into account, and I need to check with John on this, but I think there is some rebates that come back to the city by us installing the VFDs. And uh, I haven't checked with him on that yet. One more question, Mr. Mayor, uh, for Rick. It, and this goes to what he's talking about as far as hydraulic shocks. And we had some issues with some of our industries where they were at the end of the line. Have you have, have we gotten a lot of calls uh, from them recently since we maybe implemented the stuff in 2011 or not? I mean, is no, that... not not nearly as many as we used to. Okay, I, I thought that was the case. I'm just curious. All right, thank you. Any other hands, uh, Andrew, from the commission? I see none at the moment, Mr. Mayor. Well, let's see if the public has any comments or questions. For our public, if you have any public comment on this agenda item, please use the raise hand feature this time. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, again, one more time, any comments from, any more questions or comments from the commission? See and then, uh, thank you. And there's two motions to this uh, agenda item. I will take a motion for the first item. Yes, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor Good, I'd move that the Sturgis City Commission approve the bid of Wood PLC for VFD equipment and materials in the amount of $41,432.93 as presented. Support Second that. Uh, I think that was Commissioner Burr that supported. Yes. Okay, I have a motion to approve by uh, Vice Mayor Good, support by Commissioner Burr. You want to try this, Ken? Well, I've got a microphone. Does that sound any better? Oh, yes. 
Okay. All right. Because apparently my computer mic is getting tired. Uh, all righty. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner Wiki. Yes. Commissioner Littman. Skip, you're muted. Try again. Yeah, Commissioner yes. Littman. Yep, yes. Gotcha. Uh, Vice Mayor Good. Yes. Commissioner Malone. To the, if you just nod, if you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Mullins. Yes. And Mayor Heil. Yes. Okay. We'll take a motion on the second uh, proposal. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor Good, I'd move that the Sturgis City Commission approve the bid by Bylar Electric for VFD installation in the amount of $10,870 as presented. Second that. All right, a motion by uh, Vice Mayor Good and seconded by uh, Commissioner Klinger to approve. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Wiki. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Commissioner Mullins. Yes. yes. Commissioner Littman. Yes. Commissioner Malone. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. And Mayor Heil. Yes. Motion care both motions carries. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the police vehicle purchase. Uh, Public safety director. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Commissioners, uh, in your packets, you would have had our request for a bid waiver and approval to purchase a 2020 Dodge Durango pursuit rated um, all wheel drive. Um, to try to explain this a little bit. Uh, I tried to do the best I could for the write-up to explain it. Um, well, why we're requesting it now um, versus October 1st is yeah. because of COVID um, and a lot of other things and shutdowns. What we're seeing is huge problems with acquiring vehicles moving forward, um, whether that's short-term or long-term. So what I included in the uh, uh, proposal request was that we would be allowed to purchase this vehicle basically off the lot. Um, there aren't very many left on any lots to start with, um, but to add to that is the fact that right now, um, a correction from what I actually wrote up, um, Dodge isn't making any, um, you can't order any, and they can't give us a timeline as to when we will be able to order any or when they will be building them again. Uh, many of the other manufacturers are experiencing very similar um, delays, production issues, and things like that. So as part of the budget, uh, what was approved uh, a few minutes ago was $31,000 for the purchase of this vehicle. Um, just as a matter of what we were talking about prior, if we could have ordered a 2020 last year, um, the, the my deal price was $30,414. Um, right now off the lot, uh, one of the few that is left, we can purchase for $33,668. Um, having said that, we do not know what the my deal price may be once it is available um, to be ordered, et cetera. And then back to that same issue with, we have no idea time frame wise The way we have tried to set up everything with the way vehicles come in and go out of service and rotate, et cetera, um, trying to keep down on cost, et cetera, for maintenance uh, issues, things like that. We really try to stay on that timeline. Um, and due to the issues that they're having with production, uh, we're basically just trying to beat everybody else to what would be left um, and then having that unknown into the future. So I hope I explained that okay. Um, but obviously I'm open up for any questions. I also have Dennis, um, our city mechanic. Uh, he's on here as well to help with any questions that we may have, so. Um, I did have 
a question actually for our city mechanic because I was a little curious on our maintenance schedule and cycling if that's possible. Go ahead. Um, uh, so Dennis, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, I was curious about our, our cycle of maintenance when it comes to our police cruisers and uh, maybe what, where, and how, and when we determine something is detrimental enough for the exchange. I mean, is it just a normal wear and tear or do we make an effort to fix something that may, you know, uh, the car term, you know, uh, a lemon issue that may cause a problem for us? Do we, do we reach out to that limit or do we try to ride out what we can and then make the swap based on normal maintenance wear and tear? That's a really good uh question commissioner um what i like to say is first of all like with the every vehicle is different um to the fact the type of the type of use that it, it gets um a police cruiser uh we, you have to remember a police cruiser cruiser is that officer's mobile office that vehicle is almost running all the time it needs to with the electrical equipment it has in it now if we look at it on a year-based um, model year based, it may seem, wow, that car is only this old. However, when we get into these cars that we're cycling out, they're upwards of the 80,000 mile mark, and the hours that are put on them are around 14,000 hours a lot of times. So that's 14,000 hours of runtime. If you think about that, um, that's an substantial amount of runtime. And as far as if we, if we go back to the service regimen, um, what what we do is yes, they do service them. We do repairing them, um, and we've done. I mean, we've done some extensive in-house repairs, and we've done the standard maintenance. So um, there comes a point in time where we look at the reliability issue with that vehicle, um, and that's primarily what's taken into um, the whole aspect of when it's time to replace. Uh, basically, it's really about how much usage it gets and that's why if, if we look at per the fleet the police vehicles are used i mean sometimes we'll run 22 hours a day i mean they just they have to they're on the street with with what and i and uh, uh jeff could probably fill me a little bit better than this but uh as far as certain components that they run in there, the, the camera systems, the, the Wi-Fi, um, that those type of things, they require a lot of electrical current to run. Um, so the vehicle itself can't necessarily be shut off. So it, it has to run. That's great to hear. I, I appreciate all the detail. Uh, that tells me that we're more, we're highly mindful of things that come through. Um, when it comes to those electrical, uh, obviously constant electrical currents being used, are we, are we being cost effective in how we handle situations where, you know, that electrical uses, use may cause some sort of issue, like a shorting out, you know, use box blows, anything like that? No, that, yeah, that's a good question also. Um, we have to remember that these cars um, that we, we look and we put the, 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 we purchase for the city that the officers use, these particular vehicles are designed by the, the, the manufacturers as a severe duty, duty vehicle. Um, the electrical systems that are in there are actually designed to run these type of um, components. Um, and actually the way the car is designed itself, the, the computer networking system has, has evolved um, where it's even though this model of the car would be uh, the same, uh, let's say per se, in the, um, you know, the general public type, uh, Dodge Charger, for instance, some of the programming in the car is slightly different. And when these cars come, they come with an upgraded alternator. They come basically with the, the largest reserve capacity battery. Um, they're, they're totally geared different. So it's, it's the manufacturers have done their diligence in, in designing a vehicle that's made to do this stuff. Uh, but you know, you, 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 you can't recharge a battery um, when it sits there and there's no power going back in. <laughs> so that's true. <laughs> I, I appreciate you answering all my questions. Thanks for your time. Sure, no problem. Uh, Andrew, I, you're muted. Sorry about that. Commissioner Burr has his hand raised. Uh, Commissioner Burr. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Uh, so what vehicle are we replacing with this new one that you'd like to have? It's unit number 313. It's a older Dodge Charger that is, um, I don't want to say falling apart, but we're having loads of issues with so much that it's going to be sold instead of recycled down, which normally it would be recycled down to either SRO, fire marshal, uh, one of those other positions, but it's so it's become so unreliable that we're going to have to sell it. So what year is that? Uh, that's a great question. I can't, I, I don't have it in front of me. I apologize. I can get it for you later. Or if you bear with me, I can walk over to my other computer and try to pull it up. Oh, Holly's got it. I believe it's a 2017. 2017. Yes. You got that with 2017? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, one of the things, if I could say something about that, um, that vehicle, I, I did some look at, looking on it, and um, basically the, the, the resale value on it is per the police cruiser unit is around 14,000 is, is what it is, up to words of 17,000 on the resale market, just as a note. Even with the problems that it has? The problems when it would be repaired, um, I think what Jeff's talking about is the, the one that chases the other type of problem, not, not existing problems, the, the cars, we repair it, Car gets repaired, it's in good standing order. And then it's more of the concern about what's the next problem. Thank you. Uh, question I have before Andy tells me the next one. Um, it no I noticed that okay, we're going to a direct Dodge Durango fleet. Is this correct? We're going, we're not going to get chargers anymore. Okay, so the chargers are no longer available. Um, we can't. The chargers were cut out as an early production in 2020, and then it was only available to get the Dodge Durango. And so now it will probably, there's a, there's a chance they're coming back in 2021, but with the whole COVID issue, which was, which was brought up earlier, that some of the, there, there's a vendor supply issue. So normally we would have, we would have we would be starting to get or already have the prices for the 2021 models but those aren't available right now i just just spoke today i made a phone call those prices are not even available because they can't make the manufacturers can't get the prices right with the actual vendors that are supplying some of the components now either it's a, a price point issue or if it's a work labor force issue um th that's that we don't know but we're just told them we can't get the prices yet because they haven't come to an agreement. Like I said, it sort of answers my question. The idea though, the question is, so the intent moving away from the charger no. with the preference of the Durango. Is that the, what we're doing? The, the idea is, is we've tried over the years to have both SUVs and um, cars. But as Dennis said, we can't actually get chargers okay. right now. And, and we have to wait to see if they're going to actually start building them again or if we're going to have to look at a different model car. Um, but the idea is not to have an entire fleet of Durangos. No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Andrew, is there any other questions here? Uh, right. Dennis. Was next. Sorry, Jeff. Another question. Is there any questions? More questions from the commission? Vice Vice Mayor Good had his hand raised. Vice Mayor Good. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Actually, um, the question was answered. I was uh, wondering about uh, whether we were going to have an extra car, but we're going to rotate that uh, problematic during or uh, charger out of the fleet. So my question was answered. Thank you. Thank you, John. Commissioner Mullins had his hand raised. Mr. Mullins. Yeah, hey, a quick question for, um, I don't know, Jeff, Dennis, Holly, whoever, um, about the outfitting of the car. This is just for the purchase of the vehicle, not outfitting of the vehicle. Is that correct? That's correct. 
And who who will be doing the outfitting? Will we will we hire somebody to do that though? Yes, I can't think of the name of the company right now, but it's uh, located close to where John Jones is at. Do we know what that cost is? And it uh, varies depending on equipment. So if we have to purchase new equipment, which I believe with this setup, I don't think there's any of that. So usually three, four thousand and up, but it can be upwards to ten. So three to four bottom end if we reuse the equipment off of that uh, charger, is that what you're thinking? Most of it, I believe so, yes. I'd have to go back and look at all the different invoices. But like I said, it's usually, it just depends on what the swap out is. It gets higher end when we have to replace light bars, that sort of thing. Is that COPS gear? COPS gear, thank you. We've had to switch. Um, Commissioner Mullins, we've had to switch vendors multiple times on upfitting. Um, we've experienced, we've ex I don't want to say experimented, but that's probably the right word. Um, over my 24 plus years, um, we even had the mechanic at one point trying to wire them up. Um, and as Commissioner Clear asked earlier about the, all the electronics and everything else, it's really vital because what happens is, is we get a, a lot of times we get into problems with if somebody does a bad wiring job um, that we can actually toast other things and then trying to trace that back. And I hate to use the word, but blame who's at fault or why it blew up um, then becomes an issue for us. So we've had to switch a few times because of issues similar to that. Um, this latest company we've been pretty impressed with Dennis, I know has been pretty impressed with their work um, and they've been fairly reliable. So that's who we've been using. Well, I can certainly see the need for having somebody that that's, does it for a living doing the wiring and things on the public safety vehicles, no problems there. Um, I guess the, the only question is then, I guess for maybe Holly then, for the outfitting or upfitting, um, is that something that comes out of motor vehicle fund as well, or does that come from somewhere else? It comes out of motor vehicle fund. Okay. It's part of the rental. That's part of rental? The rental that we charge to the departments that are buying the vehicles. Oh, I got Part of the operation maintenance, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Commissioner Burr has his hand raised. Commissioner Burr. Yes, thank you. Uh, I see it's, it's uh, the Durango is a pursuit rated all wheel drive. Uh, do we have any of those right now or is this a uh, new hybrid? All of our vehicles are pursuit rated. And I believe Dennis can correct me, but I believe all of our vehicles are now all wheel drive, including all of our chargers, except for maybe one or two. They're like school resource officer or the fire marshals, but all the rest are all, all wheel drive. It's kind of almost standard now, but Dennis can talk more about that. Commissioner Burke. Uh, that, that, that's absolutely correct. They um, all are all wheel drive, all the, the patrol vehicles, the uh, um, the fire marshal vehicle and the vehicles that Jeff named, um, those are um, non all wheel drive vehicles. But the, the pursuit rated, is that just because it has a 5.7 Hemi in it? No, that has nothing to, to um, do with it. Um, pursuit rated is it's, there's a state requirement that requires it to become uh, pursuit rated and the manufacturer must be able to have the car perform under those guidelines. Um, which that is start, stop, handling, and acceleration is one of them. And it just comes down to key, key components, even like uh, tires that are designed for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Burr. Any other hands, Andrew? I see none at the moment, Ms. Mayor. Any hand? How about we ask for the public comments? All right, members of the public, once again, if you wish to make public comment on this agenda item, please use the raise your hand feature and we will recognize you to speak. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And one last time, any, more, any other comments or questions from the commission? Hearing, hearing none from Andrew, I will take a motion on this uh, agenda item. Your Honor, Commissioner Mullins here. I'd move that the Sturgis City Commission approve a bid waiver for the purchase of a 2020 Durango, Dodge Durango Police Pursuit rated all-wheel drive V8 from John Jones, 
auto group in the amount of 33668 as presented. Second that. We have a motion by Commissioner Mellon and seconded by Commissioner, Commissioner Klinger to approve. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Wickey. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Commissioner Mullins. Yes. Commissioner Littman. Yes. Commissioner Malone. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. And Mayor Heil. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you all. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the 2020 crack ceiling program. Barry. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Um, so the city uh, took bids on July 31st for another uh, round of overband crack ceiling as a preventative maintenance technique for our asphalt streets. Uh, we've been using uh, overband crack ceiling for a number of years and we try to maintain a two to three year cycle um, to help prevent the deterioration of the asphalt streets uh, by water intrusion into the road base. So uh, we try to use them typically on the streets that are in the best condition to extend their life overall. Um, and in your packet is, I believe, a map that indicates the priority one and priority two streets for the crack ceiling program this year. Uh, when we did receive bids, uh, uh, bid documents were uh, put together by Fleece and Vandenbrink, and we received uh, three bids back from um, the contractors that do this type of work. And uh, you should have a bid tabulation form as well in your packet, uh, as well as the letter of recommendation from Fleece and Vandenbrink regarding Wolverine seal coating, who was the low bidder on this project. Uh, we estimated for the purposes of budgeting a 50,000 pound quantity to be utilized um, based on our $90,000 budget and hopefully you know, not exceeding that. Uh, thankfully, Wolverine's bid did come back at uh, $53,000. Uh, that $53,000 uh, also includes the crack ceiling of several parking lots uh, for city-owned buildings, specifically Doyle Center, uh, Sturgis Young Center for the Arts, Public Services Building, a portion of the wastewater treatment plant, uh, driveway and, and the office area parking lots. Uh, we only did those, I think, because those are the only ones that are uh, in good enough condition to really do at this point. So, uh, as I may have mentioned, uh, in our budget this year, we had uh, $90,000 in the 2019 2020 budget for preventative maintenance activities. Um, bid, the low bid was $53,000. Uh, we are requesting the opportunity to increase the amount of poundage that we are going to use up to uh, approximately $83,500 to try to get all of the priority one and all of the priority two streets completed. And uh, at this point, I'll try to answer any questions you may have regarding this. Yes. Great. Who's talking, Andrew? I cannot. I cannot tell, Mr. Mayor. Sorry. I don't know if we're getting some background interference or something, but I can't. I can't recognize any anything coming from any of our people that aren't muted. So. Okay. Uh, uh, Barry, one question I have is: Have we? Has the city done any work with Wolverine seal coating? Uh, we have not uh, done any work with them, Mayor. Uh, we had done work with Asphalt Restoration. They did the work in 2018 and 2015. Uh, I found Wolverine seal coating actually on uh, MDOT. Uh, I was going through MDOT projects and noted uh, their name as some of the overband crack sealing work that they were doing for the state. Uh, they did provide a significant number of references primarily at the road, uh, road commission level. And uh, as I mentioned, FMV did contact uh, those folks and 
found them to be uh, suitable for this particular project. All right, thank you, Barry. Um, any hands from our commission? No, Mr. Mayor, no hands from the commission. Um, what about from our uh, listeners? Anybody in the audience, if you have public comment on this agenda item, please use the raise hand feature at this time. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Again, one last time, any questions from our, any questions or comments from our uh, commission? Seeing nothing from Andrew, um, I will uh, accept a motion on this uh, agenda item. Oh, Mr. Mayor, before before we get to that, Barry has his hand raised really quick. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Barry. That's all right. I, I just put it up there. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, the, the budgetary aspect, this is coming out of the 204 maintenance budget and as well as uh, the uh, 101, 538, 930 account, which is uh, parking lot maintenance. All right. Thank you, Barry. Now I'll get out because Barry made another comment. Any other qu any questions or comments from the commission? Seeing Andrew not saying anything. Again, I will take a motion on this agenda item. Your Honor, this is Commissioner Burr. I move that the Sturgis City Commission approve the bid for the 2020 Crack Slaying Program from Wolverine Seal Coating LLC in the amount not to exceed $83,500 and authorize the city manager to sign all necessary paperwork. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, I'd support that motion. Thank you, gentlemen. I have a motion by uh, Commissioner Burr, seconded by Vice Mayor Good to approve this motion. Uh, Ken. Okay, and uh, Andrew, uh, just uh, on the side note, I, I have a feeling it's somebody's feedback from listening to this meeting uh, that we might be picking up. But uh, on with the motion, roll call, Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Commissioner Wiki. Yes. Commissioner Lippman. Yes. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. Commissioner Malone. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Mullins. Yes. And Mayor Heil. Yes. Thank you all. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item on here, we have a traffic control order, uh, Vinewood Avenue and Congress Street. Barry. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I apologize. I did not bring home any information on the write-up for this. So I'm going <laughs> to gonna snag, snag something out of the... Uh, out of my mailbox here and hopefully I can uh, wander that, through this a little bit. Hey, there you go. Uh, thank you, Andrew, appreciate it. Um, so in your packet, uh, there's actually uh, three proposed traffic control orders for the Vinewood and single block of East Congress corridor. As you may recall, we brought in a majority of Vinewood under our Act 51 uh, jurisdiction through a jurisdictional transfer with the Road Commission, as well as that block of Congress, portion of Ivanhoe, and a, uh, as, yeah, I think that was a portion of Farwell. Uh, so right now under the existing conditions map, I'll talk to, uh, regarding traffic control order number one here. Um, East Congress between Farwell and Vinewood has uh, no parking signs on both the north side of the road as well as the south side of the road, um, which is the traffic control situation I think we want to see in that area. However, because we didn't have jurisdiction over the road, I don't think we have proper traffic control to enforce that. So that's what this first traffic control order is. It's not to change anything. It's just to basically effectively have a means to enforce it. And if Jeff's still around, he can verify that that's, we need something. Very accurate. Okay. 
Would you like me to continue, Mayor? Or would you like me to? Uh... Yeah, go ahead. So, okay, so I'm gonna move on to the second traffic controller. So that's the first one. So there's really no change. Suffolk, excuse me, the second traffic control order is for basically all of Vinewood. Uh, we only had the first block off of US 12 um, in our jurisdiction previously. And that area, as I look at my own map, had one no parking sign on the west side of the road. And basically parking was allowed uh, on the east side of the road, all the way from US 12 down to Ivanhoe. Parking is allowed on the west side from Lockwood to Ivanhoe. And then there was some restricted parking from Ivanhoe down to Congress that was school time zone related that uh, primarily has been replaced. Uh, somebody got a little ahead of me and, and been replaced with uh, no parking symbol signs. It did have uh, 7.30 to 3.30 Monday through Friday. Uh, this is a very similar situation to East Congress in regards to traffic controls and, and actually having something to enforce. But on this particular one, we are uh, looking to change the available parking, which is shown on the proposed signage map. And uh, we are proposing not to allow parking on any portion of Vinewood. One, because it's a Act 51 major street. And even though it is wider, uh, it, it, I don't believe we can have more than parking at the most. We could only have parking on one side anyway. But partially because of what we're looking at in design uh, for the project we're doing next year on Vinewood, and partially because of what's in the non-motorized plan that was approved by city commission, which says that we want to have bike lanes on Vinewood, and Vinewood is wide enough as it currently is represented to have bike lanes and traffic, but it can't have bike lanes, traffic and parking unless you want to modify something. So what we're presenting is to not have any parking on any portion of the major part of Vinewood. There is a block south of Congress that is Vinewood, but it's a local street. So that would not be included in this traffic control order. I'll try to answer any questions you might have about this one. I see no hands raised, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, and you said so there's one more, uh, Barry? Yes. Yeah, so the third traffic control order is for the installation of the stop sign at the intersection of what's going to be a, a, basically a four-legged intersection. Uh, for Vinewood and, and East Congress. Uh, we are looking to pave that small 280 foot segment of Vinewood to the south. And so all four legs will basically be paved roadway and we need to have traffic control for that south leg, which there is currently none. And so the proposal is to install a stop sign on that south leg and then add to the remaining stop signs that are currently there an all way sign before uh, below the stop signs. Okay, is there any questions for Barry on this uh, proposed traffic order? Commissioner Mullins has his hand raised. Commissioner Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the proposed number, the pro proposal number two there, the uh, traffic control order, second one you have there, the middle one, was about taking away the parking that's currently on Vinewood on the east side of the road. Is that correct? There's and park on the east side of Vinewood on certain areas. So currently on Vinewood, you can park uh, on the east side from basically US 12 down to Ivanhoe at any time. 
And you can also park on the west side of Vinewood between Lockwood and Ivanhoe at any time. There's no signage in that area to dictate it differently. There was some restricted parking between Ivanhoe and Congress in front of the high school, which has since been changed to all no parking signs. However, they're not quite in the same in the correct places right now. So we would want to move them, space them the way they should be spaced. But yes, there is uh, so there is a lost potential for parking. Uh, when this was brought up uh, internal for staff, Commissioner Mullins, uh, we had uh, Ryan Benazic look at the parking situation um, down there. Typically between Ivanhoe and Lockwood, we're not seeing any parking on the east side. However, we do see some parking on the west side and it can be one car, two cars, potentially up to four cars. And I can understand that because you, if you look at that map, there's a number of houses on the east side, small lots, small driveways, relatively limited parking opportunities other than on the street. Yeah, that was kind of my concern. Has, has, have the uh, property owners been uh, approached about this at all? No. Part of the reasoning for trying to do this right now, instead of waiting and doing as part of the project, is to basically kind of see how it gels out. And we could make modifications to a portion of this before we get full-fledged into the, the roads been resurfaced. We already got bike lanes out there. You know, that we have a little bit of time to, to more, further evaluate it in this in the structure that we want to look at it all right well i can certainly see um one side or the other being no parking but i i just can't see both sides because of the, like you said small parcels limited parking in in driveways and that kind of stuff we do have other areas of town where we have bike lanes where people park in them currently correct uh we we don't call them bike lanes we call them widened shoulders they're striped okay. Okay. <laughs> they're they're striped wider but typically they would have to be at least seven feet wide. Um, if I took one side of Vinewood and took seven feet of that and then made a bike lane, that's which is a minimum requirement of five feet, that's 12 feet of the roadway. Um, and I have to have at least two 11 foot lanes, which is 22. I'm, I'm gonna have to say, I'm gonna have to look at whether or not I can logistically make it happen. That might be an option that we could explore for that block. Let's say the west side of Lockwood to Ivanhoe on the west side. Um, but it does create perhaps a little confusion if we were to do that. Commissioner Wickey has his hand raised. Commissioner Wickey. Thank you. Uh, just a question about the street segment to be paved. Uh, will there be a turnaround at the end of the pavement there? And I'm not really showing that, am I? Um, well, we're not into heavily into design yet, Commissioner Wickey. Um, I have seen a 25% design, and it does show a small turnaround area there. The, the idea on that particular one, there is a driveway down there right now for a storage area, is to basically pave it just slightly beyond that storage area drive so that we can push snow into it. Um, there's been traffic to create a two track back over to the school's parking lot going to the east side. Okay, cause I, I was just thinking if, if it was just a straight shot and no turn around, people are just gonna turn across the grass into the high school parking lot right there uh, if there wasn't a turnaround. Well, it sounds like they're already do. It looks like they're already doing it. Um, ultimately, I don't really have any control what what people do in that regard. I mean, we can probably, if we install a turnaround, people might use it, um, but it's going to be fairly small uh, radius because Vinewood isn't that big. Yeah, it's only a fifty foot right away uh, down there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Any other hands, Andrew? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we can we can certainly bring back uh, kind of a design layout uh, to Commissioner Wiki's point when we get closer to something uh, for commission input on how we want to really handle that if if that's the desire. Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Vice Mayor. Uh, just one thing, Mayor, uh, after the action is taken here, I have another comment. I'll wait till after the action on these uh, traffic orders. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Um, Andrew, any uh, hands from our audience? Questions from our audience? Uh, for those members of our audience uh, participating via Zoom, if you wish to use the raise your hand feature, you can uh, be recognized to make public comment at this time. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I know John just said he has a, a comment after we take the vote. Are there any other comments or questions for Barry on this issue? If not, I will take a motion uh, on this issue. Your Honor, this is Commissioner Burr. I move that the Sturgis City Commission approve traffic control orders number 20-01 and 20-02 related to no parking on East Congress and Vinewood and traffic control order number 20-03 related to a stop sign at the East Congress and Vinewood intersection as presented. Support, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Um, I have a motion by Commissioner Burr in support by, by Vice Mayor Good. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Littman. Yes. Commissioner Wickey. Yes. Commissioner Malone. Yes. Commissioner Burr. Yes. Vice Mayor Good. Yes. Commissioner Mullins. Uh, since all these are bundled together and you can't vote on each and every one, I'm gonna say nay. Commissioner Klinger. Yes. Mayor Heil. Uh, yes. Uh, that would be motion carried. Motion carried, yes. Thank you, sir. Um, Vice Mayor, you said you had a comment. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, questions for Barry. Um, does the city have jurisdiction where a private drive intersects with our public right of way with regard to a traffic signal device? What? Okay, let me let me make it even more clear for you. <laughs> when, <laughs> okay. <laughs> when when one exits the Meyer parking lot at White Street on the south end, there's no traffic sign. There's no stop sign. Okay. There's no yield, there's no yield sign. Is that because we have no jurisdiction there? Uh, you know, actually, I thought at one time they did have something there and may, may have been a portable sign, like a heavy based sign, but I'm gonna have to look and see what uh, was required of them as a site plan, but a commercial drive should to a road should definitely have some kind of uh, control device indicating that they either have to yield to the people in the right of way or, um, yeah. I, yeah, and there's there there's really no uh, there's not supposed really to be, be any there's not supposed to be any traffic southbound. Um, beyond that drive other than uh, who owns that pole barn there because they put that gate across the uh, lane that I used to use to go to Fawn River Road, but I can't anymore. Anyway, uh, so I, you know, I just assume maybe they took the stop sign out because of that. I, I don't know, but I can certainly check into it. I know the, that their sign at uh, South Street, uh, apparently the, the sign itself disappeared the, the sign post is still there uh, but they've actually brought one of their portable signs over there with the, the concrete base so maybe that's where it came from uh you know in the future obviously they're gonna there's gonna need to have a need for traffic control at that southerly drive going out onto white street whether you know at some point when we actually build that out 
Um, but there should be something there. You are correct, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Barry, for all the work. Um, and, and could you please, uh, if you receive any complaints once we get things set up on the traffic control order for Vinewood, uh, direct them to me. Okay. So we can further evaluate the issues. All right. Thank you, Barry. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the water uh, assistance program. Michael. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so I'm going to give a quick overview. I'm going to assume that you read the materials provided in the packet but for the benefit of the public. Uh, the state of Michigan created a water utility assistance program. Uh, so basically to provide uh, financial relief to certain eligible customers that um, have arrearages or past due bills. Um, another part of the well, part of that is that they can receive, I think, $700, up to $700 for water and another $700 for the sewer portion of, of the bill. And then part of the requirement of participating in the program is that the water utility would provide a 25% credit or discount um, on the water bill for eligible customers. And that amount would be reimbursed uh, to the water utility uh, through this program. So there's a partnership between uh, Eagle or State of Michigan, uh, I think your local community action agency and the water utility to facilitate this relief. Um, we've been trying to really understand the program and uh, they're, they're sort of designing it as they go. Uh, we've attended a webinar to try to understand it and um, get more information, reviewed the frequently asked questions. We have more questions about how it uh, really will work and roll out, but I wanted to have a conversation with the commission first to see if this is something that we should pursue. They had an original, we'll call it an opt-in, we had to complete a survey and in the survey, you could say that you were not opting in, choosing to opt in or didn't know. So originally, I think we, we responded to the survey that we didn't know. We attended a webinar and in the webinar, they said that we had to opt in by the next day. So we um, did the survey again and said that we would opt in because we were told that um, you should opt in if you plan to participate in any way, but you can back out at any time. So that's kind of where we're at, but there's another date for opting in, which is August 21st. There's a couple of steps that have to take place. They require what's called a data sharing agreement. So they're trying to basically facilitate information from the water utility about customers so that they, they can have that. Um, and I think that that agreement would be with the state and the, and the community action agency and they can take the data. Once we do that, then I think we could move forward with the program. Um, again, we have a lot of questions and I think there's some unknowns and probably um, they're gonna be um, modifying the program as they discover issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, so looking for a little bit direction, I think we need some flexibility in pursuing this. I know other cities have concerns about the data sharing agreement and whether they can feasibly provide the data necessary in a, an effective way. So sometimes, you know, a city or water utility may not easily be able to, to transmit data or maybe our software program won't work well with, you know, generating reports with what they need. Those are some of the questions. Um, but at the same time, it seems like they want us to react quickly um, to decide if we're going to participate. And if so, I, I'd like to see what the direction of the commission is. Okay, is there any questions from Michael? Andrew, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mike, um, obviously this is a, a program that's in a state of flux and 
we don't know exactly how this is all going to shake out. But the, the question would be, uh, how much will our ratepayers be able to benefit if we uh, opt in and the program is developed uh, properly? I mean, is it is it worthwhile to our uh, ratepayers to for us to get involved with a program that uh, sounds like it's on three legs and uh, the table may tip over any time? I you know I don't. It sounds pretty shaky to me. Well, I think that those customers that we have that have arrearages or you know could use a discount, I, I think they would be interested. Um, and that's part of the challenge is that you have programs that are, you know, part of what they do is distribute funds to people. Uh, but what they don't probably understand is how utilities work. So they're trying to learn quickly to, you know, deliver this program. Um, I mean, I think that there can be a benefit for our customers. What I don't know is you know, I think there's a big question mark on really how far that $25 million will go. And in the, the initial webinar, they told us that we would have to provide the 25% discount, even if the funds were exhausted. And so in my mind, that was a, that was a non-starter. Um, the next day after they told us that in the webinar, they clarified and changed position in the FAQ. And I think that's number 11 in the FAQ document that was in the packet. But now they're saying, well, if you won't have to provide the 25% discount if the funds aren't available, which I think is good because I'm not sure any water utility would participate. Um, I know that you know cities are frustrated because there's a lot of questions and what they're concerned about is, you know, there's there's probably a whole lot of effort that has to be undertaken and without really having a sense of, of how much funds will be received, you don't wanna go through a whole process of setting up for this program, you know, exhausting a lot of resources and then you don't get much on the other end. But I, I don't think there's a good way to know, to know what that is, frankly. What is the source of the 25 million? This, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, this was appropriated through a Senate bill. It could be CARES Act funding, but I, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. Well, I, I personally uh, don't know how to give you direction on something we don't know very much about. You know, uh, it, to be confused and then to give you a direction on which way to go, uh, it seems a little difficult for, for me anyway to say, hey, Mark, uh, Mike, charge ahead with this uh, uh, when you really don't know what's going on. It's a challenge. <laughs> I, I mean, I'd say so. It's going to be, I think, a learning process from both. And I, I, I will say that I imagine if we get to the point where, you know, we're concerned about the time and effort that's put in versus the, you know, the return of what our customers might see, then we're probably going to be interested in, in discontinuing in the program, you know, but I, I, I know one of the survey questions that they were asking utilities was um, what their current arrearage amount was. And so maybe that I'm, I'm suspecting they're asking that question so they can figure out how far they, you know, how far the funding will go, but we don't have that information. We don't know what that looks like. And of course, we, we also have no idea whether there's going to be money left over to reimburse on the 25% credit. Yeah, they do keep they do keep yeah. saying that they that they um that you won't be shorted that yeah they they came back and I, I don't know if they misspoke or weren't prepared for the question but they they did come back and they've reinforced in a couple of different communications that I've seen that you won't be required 
to provide the 25% credit if the funds are uh, no longer there. But James Hisong shared an email with me, um, I believe it was yesterday, but there's another communication he received that we have to opt in by August 21st. We, we don't have a commission meeting um, before the 21st. Commissioner Burr does have his hand raised. Commissioner Burr. Yeah, I'd have to uh, agree with Mike is 25 million doesn't seem like an awful lot of money for the whole state of Michigan, uh, especially since this pandemic and people aren't paying their bills and how much the larger cities are behind 25 million doesn't sound like it's going to go a long way. No, it just doesn't sound like they've really, uh, as Commissioner Good pointed out, uh, they haven't really seemed to finish the whole project yet. They want you to buy into it before it's completed. So I would tend to opt out or hold on and see if, if no one's opting in, they might just uh, extend the deadline. Well, that's possible. Um, it's interesting because the other programs that they rolled out, the deadlines that they um, they established, you know, we we really hustled. Uh, I think Holly did a whole bunch of work um, to be able to submit for those programs. I mean, James and others too. And uh, then they, they extended the program um, uh, so that other municipalities could participate. Of course, there's no way to know if that's gonna happen on this program, but it's um, good logic. Commissioner Wiki has his hand raised. Commissioner Wiki. Thanks. Uh, the question is, is, what is our risk in opting in? Is it just staff man hours? And I don't mean just, but is there other risk involved besides that? Yeah, so I, I thought about that. Um, I, I think that there's the risk is expending staff resources. Um, the other thing might be putting an expectation out there from customers that this program would be available. And, I, and that's, I, I'm concerned about that of, um, you know, we say we're gonna opt in and then um, we have some real big concerns and issues and then people, um, this expectation that they had has changed. It, it, you know, what they said in the, um, oh gosh, I think, I'm not sure if it was in the webinar or the FAQ, um, is that we wouldn't have to, the, the only risk is that we wouldn't have to pay things back um, if, uh, okay, I'm sorry, let me back that up. Um, we'd only have to pay things back if we receive payment. So if we opted in and went down some road, yes, we've, we might have wasted some staff time, um, but we wouldn't have to be obligated to anything else unless we received the payment that might have to be paid back. I got to believe we would know where we're at by the time that happens, but I don't know that for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wickey. Uh, Andrew? Vice Mayor Good has his hand raised. Vice Mayor Good. Uh, Mike, uh, or any other, uh, want to chime in like Holly. Uh, if we were, let's say we opt into this program and uh, are we encouraging uh, some of those people that might be borderline to say, well, I'm not making my. Uh, water payment now, they're gonna get some money from the state and uh, they'll pay my bill for me. Are, is, there, is there a possibility that we would encourage that uh, by participating in the program? I, it's possible um, if someone were paying attention, you know, now and watching the news and they read that that um, arrearages since March 1st might be reimbursed up to $1,400. Maybe they would. Um, I don't know if anybody's really tracking it like that. I, you know, Hal and I were talking, but 
I don't understand why they created a whole new, whole new program. They have utility assistance now, and it seems like for the same you know eligible people. So I don't know why they just didn't distribute additional utility assistance funds. Um, this maybe gets more you know attention, but those programs are already in place. Um, so I'm not sure why they chose to recreate something. You know, it might just be another bureaucratic boondoggle. You know? Uh, <laughs> not that <laughs> Any other comments? Andrew? I see no other hand raised, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, I see no other hands raised. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mayor, I was just going to point out that there was a question as to where this money came from, and it it's all generated from Senate Bill 690, which is the appropriation of the federal coronavirus relief fund. So that's it's coming from the federal government. Which is us. That's us. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, any comment? Open up to the comments from the audience, Andrew. Uh, anybody in the audience wishes to make public comment on this agenda item, please use the raise hand feature. We'll recognize you. I see none, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Andrew. Um, again, there is no motion to this. You're just looking for guidance or consensus whether to continue in. Uh, Michael? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess my feeling is, is I think we're not overwhelmed by this uh, issue, this agenda item. But um, commissioners, what do you want to do here? Do you want to let, let uh, staff continue to research this or opt in? We can always opt out. My question is uh, to Mike, uh, what's your recommendation in this? Well, thanks, Commissioner Wicke. Um, I, I think that, I really think that we should continue to pursue it. Um, I think, I, I guess my hope is that by, you know, maybe the second meeting, we'll have better information. So um, I, I hate to get into a situation where we sort of regret not pursuing it because of some of the unknown. Um, so my hope is that by the next meeting, We'll have better information to to make a decision that we're all more comfortable with, but I, I don't see a huge downside of opting in on the 21st, bringing you more information on the 26th, and trying to make a decision then. Um, I also don't want to represent that we'll have great information then either, but I I hope. Michael, how many hours do you think we've got into this uh, project so far? Uh, I think. What do you think we're going to have? All staff, we probably have four, four to six hours. I mean, a few of us watched a webinar and had some discussions internally and reviewed some of the documents. Um, I, I think the real staff, you know, work is going to be the, you know, exporting or trying to give them the data that they need. I'm much more concerned about that. It's going to be much more. Um, much more work uh, from staff to do those types of things. Thank you. Um, Sheikh, I nod your head. Yes, we want to let Michael continue on with this program or a thumbs up. I'm seeing quite a few thumbs up. There we go. Uh, Michael, continue on with what you're doing. Okay, uh, I'll try to keep you updated. And uh, Mike, make sure you include the half hour we spent on it tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <Mike's> Mayor. <laughs> the last item on our agenda tonight is a 2020 county tax foreclosure properties. Michael. Thank you. I need more commission direction. Um, so this is that time of the year that the county submits a list of tax foreclosed properties that we have first option to purchase. Um, we provided those addresses to you that it's 207 North Jefferson, 215 First Street, and 602 North Prospect. Um, 
talked with staff and also Monica Smith, and just try to get, to get some familiarity with these properties. Probably just like you, I, I drove by them uh, just to see them from the street. And um, I will say that based on the information that we have, um, and of course, we're, we're not able to go inside of them at this point in the process. Um, in fact, we could have one that's still occupied um, or maybe more, but just from driving by, it looked like one is possibly still occupied. I, I don't know that for certain. Um, but based on what we know and you know the information that we have, all three could possibly be uh, prospects for demolition. Uh, so that I want to make sure that's known kind of going into this. Uh, the other thing that you should be aware of is I received, this is an email from County Treasurer Judy Rattering, who obviously isn't going to be treasurer in the future. Uh, but she let us know that there was a court case that impacts their ability to participate in the demolition partnership that we did last year. Uh, so what she was saying is don't expect us to participate in a um, in demolishing these these projects. And I think we all preferred that partnership that we had last year. Um, so that also should be known. Uh, if we did acquire these properties, we, we do what we have done in the years past. We would um, walk through those with Will, probably a contractor representative of um, Sturgis Neighborhood Program, and then also Monica Smith. We would do an evaluation of whether um, we would, SMP would acquire those, or maybe we would um, sell those for uh, private renovation. And, and if not, possibly demolish those. So we, I believe we had some uh, photos in the packet as well. You have the, the acquisition amounts. There's going to be some additional costs probably related to mowing and taxes on top of that. We always do our best to recover those. Not much recovery happens if we, if we demolish them. OK. Any questions from Michael? Anything on that, that, that you're concerned about? There is no motion on this. Yeah, I don't have a motion. Um, of course, if we want to acquire them, we have to decide that tonight. And then you're going to need a motion. Uh, that we have to notify what our um, interest is to the okay. county. OK. Susie. Can you, hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yay. Um, I have a question about the house that may have somebody living in it because I don't believe we can kick them out of it anytime soon with the COVID um, executive orders. And so should we be worrying about the house that actually has somebody living in it at this time? I Actually, I'm not sure what the status of that eviction um, executive order is. I thought that might have expired, but I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Which, um, I mean, am I allowed to ask which residents specifically? Oh, is? This is me driving by and speculating. Um, okay. I don't know if Ken, you can quickly look at, if, or Holly, you can look at electric usage. I'm checking. Okay. Um, but I think it was uh, Jefferson, North Jefferson. Okay. First Street, I didn't see any activity in the same same for them. She's been in hospice for months. That I know. Are I've had to mow that yard a couple times at First Street. Okay. Vice Mayor Good had his hand raised. Vice Mayor. Uh, yes. Uh, since uh, we have the opportunity to put these out for bid for someone to uh, rehab uh, after we make acquisition and or decide that demolition is the uh, uh, better course of action, I would, uh, I would think that um, it would be in our best interest to 
uh, purchase these three properties and then have the opportunity to make that decision. Uh, we always have to keep our eyes on uh, the condition of our city in general. And uh, I know when they do these uh, master plan reviews, they always talk about blighted areas and that the uh, city should do what they can to cure the city of its blighted areas. So um, in that uh, regard, since uh, we need to uh, give our manager direction, I would make a motion that the city proceed to purchase the three properties, 207 North Jefferson, 215 First Street, and 602 North Prospect uh, at the tax sale. And I have a motion. Would someone want to second that motion? A point of order, Your Honor. Yes. I had my hand raised prior to the I motion. Gonna, I was gonna ask if there's anybody else. I mean, that's fine, go ahead. Okay. Um, one thing I'm concerned about is the, uh, the buildings themselves. I don't believe that the neighborhood project would be interested in any of those. They're already behind. They haven't done anything with Wenzel at all. Uh, they're still uh, working on the one out at Ohio Court. Um, sounds like we're kind of getting ahead of the, the, the program here. Uh, the other thing is, in the past, we've just uh, let the uh, let them go to the county and uh, why pay for them and then have to pay for tearing them down all of all our on our own dime. So I think we should just basically let them go back to the county. I want to add something to that. If they go back to the county, they go to uh, up for auction. If they don't get bid on. Then what happens, remind us what happens to those. We talked about this a couple, a couple times. What happens if that happens? Well, how would that work, Michael, do you know? I believe they would go to public auction if they don't sell a public auction, in, because I think they do a minimum bid on the back taxes. And then if they go to another auction, they may lower the price. So we can actually get them for a lot less money. I, I'm sort of in agreement with Mr. Commissioner Burr. Why pay the full price? Let's take a chance. Well, I, that assumes that someone won't buy them at auction. Yeah, but again, we're not responsible. We're not have, if they do get bought, we hope they re, re, uh, refurb them and then we're not turning them down. We don't have the cost for, for that. Well, uh, uh, can I chime in here or no? Just, we do. Mr. Lip has been waving at me. <laughs> we, right. we also have a couple other commissioners with their hand raised too, Mr. Right. Mr. Lippman first. Unmute, unmute yourself, Skip. There you go, Skip. All right, I got to side with, uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Burr that brought this up. Why would we want to take over somebody else's problem and somebody else's junk? The uh, last thing I think we need is, if it's not going to work, get rid of it. But I don't want to see taxpayer money go into something like that and then I'm stuck with it. I don't agree with that at all. What I gotta say. And Commissioner Commissioner Wiki and then Commissioner Mullins. Okay, Commissioner Wiki. Uh, my comments similar to Commissioner Burr's. Um, just the possibility of letting it ride, and uh, you know, if, if somebody buys it and they rehab it, great. Uh, but if if they don't, uh, then we have the opportunity of buying it at a lesser price. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mullins, you said, Andrew? That's correct. Commissioner Mullins. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the same things I'll echo from Commissioner Burr, Littman, um, Wiki, except for that, uh, and even you, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the opportunity to buy now versus later at a cheaper rate, I don't even see the sense in buying later at a cheaper rate if we have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to tear these things down. Um, we're going through a bad time right well right now we are we're not seeing the effects quite yet but i'm sure next year we're going to be looking at some shortfalls in places and i just can't see us spending money on on properties to take it off the county's hands and to add to it they've already said that they're they're no longer interested in helping us with the cost associated with tear, tearing those things down which 
leads me to believe even more that we should not be purchasing the properties that are not um, suitable for the Sturgis Neighborhood Program. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, Vice Mayor Good, I know you, got, you want to chime in here. Uh, I just wanted to say I'll withdraw my motion. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, any other comments from the commission? It may be moved, but all these uh, properties have the water turned off uh, for some time, so uh, they shouldn't be occupied, certainly. Thank you, Ken. Uh, any, any comments from the, from the audience, Andrew? One more time for audience members, if you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. I see none. Um, from what I understand, from what I got, go ahead, Michael. <laughs> yeah, um, I wouldn't disagree with the thought process um, because I don't. I think it's very situational. I just want to kind of throw out a different perspective, and and maybe it isn't an argument for any of these houses, but. I mean, part of um, what we should consider is if there is a house that is blighted and it is having a, a detrimental effect on a neighborhood, then that's part of why we exist. And if it's in the interest of the public to demo that house so it doesn't deteriorate values, then it may make sense. Um, that doesn't mean it makes sense for these houses, but in the future, there could be um, a house worth eliminating so that people don't want to move away. This, that's just another perspective. Oh, I also wanted to mention, and I, I think this, we looked at the packet, there were two lots that we didn't list just because in the past, um, unless there was some unique situation with a lot, uh, we hadn't been interested, but there's a lot also for sale on 307 John and 604 South Clay. So we're not recommending to buy those at all, I just want to make sure you're aware. Thank you, Michael. Um, again, I'm just getting an idea here what the commission do we pass? That's the, the what I'm getting the feeling for is to pass on these and possibly just wait them out and see what happens after the auction. Or do we buy them? Pass. Down. All for passing. I think we're, we're going to turn these down, Michael. I think that's what it sounds like at least this time. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you all for that. We are, that's the last item on our agenda. We are to the commissioner and staff comments. Let's see if I can figure this out here. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, do you have any comments? Uh, no, I'm all set. Thanks. Thank you. Election, the election went okay. Uh, it, uh, it was interesting, uh, trying to space, uh, voters out, uh, six feet, uh, we had about uh, 500 people in the auditorium that day. Um, and that is an interesting thing. November, it'll be more. Uh, we're probably gonna have to use the whole thing. I hope it's a nice day in case people end up outside um, because that is a possibility again, if, um, if uh, in spacing people out, but uh, it went, uh, went pretty smoothly. Good. Um, Holly. I don't have any comments, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Rick Miller still with us. Nothing tonight, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Public Safety Director. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, Roger. Nothing tonight, Mayor, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Roger. Um, Andrew, again, as always, thank you for all you do for this. Any comments? Yes, Mr. Mayor, just uh, really quickly, we received uh, a message from uh, Waste Management Service uh, Looks like we got it uh, yesterday. Uh, Rick forwarded it to me. They're asking to start earlier than the normal 7 a.m. Uh, start for collection time. They're looking at 5.30 and they're asking to do that just this Friday, August 14th. That's because of the upcoming citywide garage sale. Uh, they've noted that in the past they've had some difficult times getting down roads because of the garage sale and the parking on the streets and people walking and they wanna be as safety conscious as possible. Um, just wanted to get commission opinion on this uh, request as we will occasionally get comments about garbage trucks and the times that they start collection in town. Um, so I think our general thought is for this one time only, we don't 
necessarily have a problem saying yes, but wanted to get commission opinion on that. Do any of the commissioners have any opinion on letting uh, waste management start a little bit earlier? I say yes. I'm all for that. No problem one time. Okay. It looks any... like uh, we got, I don't see anybody saying no. <laughs> time. All right. Thank all you. Right. That's it. Thank, thank you, Grand. Again, yep. thank you for what you're do, doing, how, doing a Zoom meeting. Uh, sure. City Manager. Nothing this evening, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's start it here at the top in my screen. Uh, Commissioner Wicky. Uh, I got nothing for tonight. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Mullins. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, as we all know, we've been talking about the budget tonight, and um, I've got some real concerns about what it's going to look like here um, later this year, and especially in the next year when we start looking at the numbers of the effects of this year. I um, feel like some of the funds may be dwindling and this kind of thing. Um, the biggest, I guess there's some areas of, of, of purchases that we're looking at. One that, one that I can see is uh, one nearly $1.2 million worth of um, you know, vehicle and equipment purchases each year. Um, Vice Mayor Good had said something earlier in the night about um, public safety and not wanting to, you know, diminish any funds and things like that. Um, after the explanation by our mechanic and things on the wear and tear on those vehicles, I can see a need for that type of stuff. I'm afraid that maybe next year it might not be the same for, for everything in, in all departments um, and thinking that there may be some need for a... Uh, you know, some kind of a moratorium on those types of things for particularly equipment and other vehicles that could we could use another year or two on that particular on those particular pieces of equipment and vehicles. Um, not necessarily police cruisers and uh, so much, but but uh, thinking of other departments. So I uh, just want to put that out there that things you know not only there, but that's just the first one that came to mind because that was one of the problems on the or one of the uh, items on the agenda. And the other thing for with Holly. Um, this budget uh, that we had in the uh, agenda tonight, is this something that I can use as my Bible as an electronic version or are there some tweaks and things that need to be made before? And will we you'll receive a, a copy? You'll get a final, the one that you have in your packet tonight you're talking about, you'll get a final one that will include uh, Mike's budget letter. So you'll get okay. like the final version, but uh, there isn't anything in there that should change. As okay, far as so the numbers go, but we'll you'll get, get a final one. We'll, we'll, get, will we still get hard copies of those? Yes. Okay. And uh, I guess at that point, then I can just use this, what we have here for the finalized, besides the uh, the mic letter. We'll, we'll yeah. get you a full PDF of the, of the entire budget. Okay. You'll send that to everybody then? We'll send that to everybody. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, city staff, for all you do. Thank you, Commissioner Maltz. Uh Commissioner Clarence. Uh, yeah, uh, to backpack off of what Jeff said, I did actually have a question for the city mechanic um, regarding that and next year. I, I, I'm now curious, do we have a, uh, like a foresight to our maintenance schedule and our expected cycle of vehicles that you can determine from? Like, can you see nine months out what we would plan to change, uh, Dennis? And if so, is that something that we can look forward to further? Uh, Dennis is with us right now, Commissioner Clinton, but I don't know if can, oh. can answer that question. Is that uh, specific to police or in general? I guess, I guess in general to both sides, since, you know, Jeff made the point that it's all equipment and I, I, I do ask specifically the police cruisers, but it can be both sides. So I, I guess Holly can probably take part of it, Rick, because they're both on the vehicle committee also, but like for police fire and that type of stuff we try to have like a set schedule mm -hmm. um but for maintenance it's whatever scheduled for the dealer the manufacturer or whatever routine maintenance uh the mechanic decides and then we just okay. take it in but as far as replacement we've tried really hard to come up with a determination on rotation because of issues that we've had years ago with either stacking too long um, and that type of thing. Okay. I guess the only thing I would add, I mean, we do have a motor vehicle committee that, that we look, that we, when we purchase a new piece of equipment, we 
estimate how long we're going to keep that piece of equipment. And then when it comes up for its due time of rotation, then we kind of evaluate it and, and decide whether or not to push it a year or not. Um, if you recall in the budget that we have right now, we have several pickup trucks that we have in the in the to be purchased next year with the idea that we're going to actually keep them for a shorter time and you know we use them a couple of years and rotate them out. Um, what you know one issue we you know individually we may keep our vehicles a long time, but one of the things that I have to really remember sometimes it's easy to think that way, but when you're talking about the whole fleet as a whole and you have a lot of vehicles and we only have one mechanic. So if we have, you know, a whole bunch of things that are really old then really we're gonna end up having to have a second mechanic because it's impossible to keep everything, you know, running. So it's just kind of that balance between, you know, the, the finding the best price, like that vehicle, the charger they're talking about selling, um, you know, it's at 81,000 miles, which is, you know, if anybody buys a used car, you know, that 100,000 mile mark is oftentimes, you know, kind of a turning point. So if you can get rid of it. So it's always kind of the balance between evaluating, you know, we try to push when we can, but we definitely, you know, try to set up a, a target for how long that piece of equipment's gonna last when we buy it. Okay. Um, if I can, and, if uh, I, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just gonna say that I'm not, I, I'm not, don't make it sound like, I don't wanna make it sound like I'm just picking on motor vehicle fund. I'm, I'm not that, that's not it at all. I'm just talking about just having to, uh, really uh, tighten up the belt a little bit in, in the upcoming year or two after this pandemic is has worked its way through. Um, mm -hmm. but that just happened to be the one that was up tonight because there was a lot of conversation about the vehicle yeah. and the, and the uh, a budget amendment and these kind of things. Um, that was just one area that I could see where we might be able to save some by, by putting a halt to purchases for a year or so and making up a you know million plus bucks possibly or around that area. So that was just one area. I'm sure there's other areas, but we're gonna have to do that in our budget uh, workshop, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I could totally, I, I totally support what you're saying too, Jeff. And I guess I just used that more specifically, like you said, as an example, but uh, most, most definitely. And then I just wanted to uh, uh, stand firm on my support of our public uh, safety director, uh, Jeff Smith, after reading some open editorials in the paper, I was a little disappointed in the way we, some see in the public uh, how uh, his decisions uh, benefit our town, but I, uh, I, still, uh, I still appreciate all you do, Jeff, and uh, thank you for everything. And that's all, guys. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Burr. Yes, uh, I do have an item. Uh, it seems that uh, most of our meetings are plagued by problems with Zoom, uh, back feeding, a uh, lot, of, lot of noises, uh, bad reception. Uh, I'm kind of torn. I'd kind of like to go back to a uh, meeting down at the uh, auditorium. I think that we showed that our our COVID plan of um, separation and wearing our masks showed that we didn't contact any um, any kind of illnesses. I thought it was well done, and I would like to see us go back to that. I don't know how the other commissioners feel about that, but I think it's uh, it's a little bit longer to have it on Zoom, uh, obviously because we have to wait for public comment and. Um, like I say, it's, uh, we did get a lot of back feed and it was, it was very hard to hear, uh, for quite a bit of the, the meeting. And I don't know how that, uh, how that affected the commissioners, but on my end, it was very hard for me to hear a lot of that. Um, so my, that would be my recommendation is that we go back to a, a, a personal meeting. I, I, I talked to Michael about that today, uh, Commissioner uh, Burr. Uh, Mike, Michael, would you like to address that? Come yeah, on. so I, it's kind of an open question of whether we can uh, do that. And I don't know if it's a completely clear. Uh, Roger, do you have any opinion on that? I do. Um, one of the more recent executive order, orders 2020-160 came out July 29th, um, and that 
deals with, among other things, uh, workplace safety and individual responsibility. But the first uh, bullet point in terms of the order deals with remote work. And what the governor says is any work that is capable of being performed remotely, uh, i.e. without the worker leaving his or her home or place of residence, must be, must be performed remotely. Um, I see the issue of, of a in-person in commission meeting more being a, an issue with respect to protecting our employees um, and those that would need to participate in the meeting. Uh, we know we can do it remotely because uh, we're doing it right now, even though there may be some hiccups we could deal with. I think it's unclear whether the uh, remote work by an employee would also apply directly to commissioners. That is somewhat of an open issue, but um, based upon the governor's relatively recent executive order, um, it's my opinion that we don't have the authority uh, to go um, back yet to in-person meetings uh, until that order is modified. Okay, thank you, Roger. Uh, one other comment before I uh, give it up is, I don't know if anyone drove by the, uh, the um, post office today, but there was a recall petition for Governor Whitmer. Uh, Sunday, there was one down at the park. Uh, I'm sure that there'll be a few more popping up around the city if anyone wants to jump on the bandwagon there. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you. I guess I'd like to say if, um, I mean, at the point that we're allowed to go back to in-person meetings, I, it seems to be much um, work a whole lot better. Um, I guess the other concern that I would have is just when the health department gets involved and they're reviewing your situation and requiring quarantine, I get concerned about that too. But um, yeah, I've, in person meetings, I think would would run a whole lot smoother. So. Thank you, Michael. Roger, uh, thank Roger. Thank you for your 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 input on on Commissioner Burr's question. Mr. Uh, Mayor, Commissioner Quinger did have his hand raised on that. I I was a little curious, uh, Roger, if if these Zoom meetings, these remote meetings, cause a detriment in our ability to function. I mean, is that grounds to move back to in-person if it's acceptably, you know, a standard is acceptable and put in place as far as safety goes. I, I mean, I, I know I've had communication issues in the past, but, I, you know, I know that we haven't had a situation yet where we lose a quorum because of it, but, you know, things happen. Someone ran into a post the other day in town and <laughs> losing power in the midst of a commission meeting could be a a changing factor in a situation like this, you know? Um, well, I, I, based upon the language of the governor's order, I don't think there's much flexibility. I would, I okay. would point out that order 162 mm -hmm. dealt with region six and eight that are up north. And <laughs> she clarified that with respect to those two regions, um, uh, she ordered that uh, they should do remote work, should do as opposed must do. So that's that's an indication of opening up uh, her order. At some point in time when our region reaches the appropriate stage, I think she will then go to the should meet uh, at, you know remotely. Uh, that would give us greater flexibility to make our own determination. Um, you know, a further concern is if, if there is um, a, uh, an event where somebody that attends the meeting uh, comes down uh, and tests positive on it, uh, all of a sudden we've got an awful lot of personnel that we've got to quarantine. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that can get somewhat problematic in terms of how efficiently we're going to be able to run uh, the government you know, run the city. So yeah, I can understand. Um, not an easy decision. Uh, fully appreciate uh, in-person works a lot better and everybody wants to get there. 
I think it's more a question of, of when is it going to be appropriate, not not if. Uh, I appreciate sure. that, right? Thank you for the input. Um, Mr. Mal uh, Malone. Mr. Mr. Mayor, Director yeah. Smith had his hand raised. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse. Roger covered it a little bit and Mike did just really well. Also, she kicked out Executive Order 166 on Monday. You can check that out. But it, as far as operations go for the city, she added in there now that if you have close contact with somebody um, that has symptoms, and so they don't even know it's COVID, but it's one of the primaries. So somebody has a sore throat, you're now expected to also quarantine until that person gets a negative COVID test. So operationally, um, between those couple, three executive orders, it, it could be a real nightmare. Just so, I, like I said, I don't want to beat a dead horse and Roger covered it there towards them pretty well, so. Thank you, Jeff. Any more comments on, on this? <laughs> Try to go on here. Um, Commissioner Malone. Um, all I can say is, hey, pray for your teachers. We're going back in person and virtual, so it'll be a fun time. So other than that, nothing tonight. Thank you. I appreciate you. Uh, Commissioner Littman. Yes, it's idiot yet, and we still have one in Lansing, but uh, it seems like you're trying to rule with special orders. At some point in time, it's got to reveal where the quality of those decisions are coming from. And I don't see an MD or a DDS at the end of her name providing guidance in that respect. So I think it's getting to be a major overreach. And when you get reach an overreach, it sometimes doesn't mean as much as it used to. Other than that, I've got nothing. Thank sure. you much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Vice Mayor Good. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I have always felt that uh, one of the um, purposes of uh, being a city commissioner is to protect the uh, health, safety, and welfare of the city. And uh, with regard to the uh, delinquent properties, uh, I thought that those three properties uh, they threaten the uh, public health, safety, and welfare of the city. And uh, by ignoring the acquisition of those three properties, I think we've failed the city in uh, protecting their general health, safety, and welfare. And uh, perhaps the only person that might be directly impacted would be one of the commissioners that lives on First Street. But uh, since you don't live next door to the rest of those properties, I guess they won't impact your lives at all. So uh, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, basically, I want to thank all, all of you tonight. It was a long meeting. Um, I, I will tell you, I am on vacation. I am calling you. For, I'm on this meeting from South Haven. And my wife and I left Sunday, and we will be home Sunday. So we're up here for a week, enjoying the great weather and enjoying it up here. Uh, at that point, I, I got no other comments. Uh, I'm going to close this meeting. Unless there's anybody else want to say anything, have any more comments? Not we're adjourned. Commissioner Klinger had his hand raised just before the wire. Uh, if you're bored Sunday, Bob, you can watch me jump out of a plane off of South Haven Beach. On what day is that? Sunday, at ten o'clock. I'll be back on the road. I'm heading home. <laughs> All right. For a long time, but no, it's a it's a good it's a nice place. But thank you. You're uh, welcome.